All right, uh, we now have a quorum and we'll begin the closing the justice gap working group meeting. This meeting is being recorded. Before I do the roll call, we ask that anyone who plans on giving public comment to use the raise hand function to indicate that you'd like to do so. Now with permission of the chair, we'll do the roll call. Uh, yes, Justice thank Duker. you. Justice Duker. I'm here. Mary Baldwin. Here. Becky Sandifer. Here. Marta Alkenbrock. Here. Andrew Arruda. Judge Irma Asbury. Judge Wendy Chang. Here. David Engstrom. Tom Green. Dan Grunfeld. Here. Eric Helen. Here. Kathy Huang. Micah Star Liberty. John Lund. Here. Kevin Moore. Wendy Musell. Here. Kristen Passmore. Lucy Rika. Here. Toby Rothschild. Here. Jim Salmon. Here. Patricia Scatiero. Sacha Steinberger. Here. Thank you. All right, thank you. If we could proceed now to public comment. Okay, um, if you'd like to give public comment, please use the raise hand function. Just giving it a minute so I can see how many people we will have. Okay, uh, you'll be each be given two minutes. Um, we'll start with Olivier Tellio. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, my name is Olivier Tellio. I'm the partner at BDNJ, which is a plaintiff side personal injury law firm. I started my career as a law clerk for the Central District of California, Judge Baird, moved on to the Ninth Circuit uh, for Judge A. Wallace Tashima, practiced at O'Melveny and Myers for a few years and opened a civil litigation, commercial litigation firm for many years and have been doing plaintiff's work now since 2014. I speak against the formation of a sandbox or the commoditization of legal services to non-lawyer entities. The duties of a corporation are at odds with the concept of legal representation. Corporations by law have a duty to their shareholders to maximize profits, period. They have no duties to their customers. We have seen this play out many times. One only needs to look at the latest disclosure of the Facebook data on how it engineers hate to know that technology companies do not put public interest at the forefront of their business models. Of course, there are examples of unscrupulous attorneys out there who don't do that. But I will say that for most, they do. I, for one, know that as a lawyer, I cannot count the number of times that I've had to take actions that was not in my best interest, but in the interest of my clients. It is one of the foundations of being a lawyer that at the very core, we are advocates for our clients above our own interests. The Sandbox eliminates this concept and places in the hands of profit-driven companies, consumers who, for decades now, believe that their representatives have their best interests in mind. Additionally, what happens when one of these companies fails because of a faulty business model? What happens to the hundreds of cases that they have pending? Who takes care of these clients and at what cost? As attorneys, we cannot abandon our clients, yet there is nothing stopping a corporation from shutting its doors and prejudicing hundreds of consumers who will. Thank you for letting me make these comments. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. My name is Jennifer Kramer. I'm a co-managing partner at Hennig Kramer Ruiz and Singh, and I'm a board member of the California Employment Lawyers Association. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. I'm here to talk about that the sandbox for legal services is an untested idea that could lead to the permanent erosion of worker and consumer protections under the guise of fostering, fostering innovation in the consumer legal marketplace. Sandboxes were initially started in the UK as a safe space for businesses to test products, services, and business models without immediately incurring all the normal regulatory consequences of engaging in the activity in question. In other words, a sandbox allows the ones that are permitted entry to waive the rules that everyone else must abide by in the hopes that they will want to provide a good or a service in that, that the regulator wants. 
There, these have mostly been launched in the financial services and sandboxes for legal services are largely new and untested. While the committee upholds Utah as a model, the Utah is the only state that has started to implement a legal services sandbox. We still do not have data that a sandbox will work for legal services. Thus the state bar could be simply embarking on a costly bet that will cost us millions. This is against the backdrop of the pandemic where our courts are backlogged and struggling to come back from the delays imposed by the shutdowns. Another sandbox that can serve as a cautionary tale is one launched by the Consumer Federal Protection Bureau under the Trump administration, a sandbox for financial services. Over 80 consumer groups oppose the Consumer Federal Protection Bureau sandbox proposal, remaining. including 21 attorney generals, California included. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Next, uh, we have Tiffany Howard. Thank you for the time, taking the time to listen to my comments. I'm a California licensed attorney and currently serve as general counsel as well as a lobbyist at a small lobbying firm in Washington, DC. Today, I would like to address my concerns regarding the state bar's ability to conduct oversight if the sandbox proposal goes through. In April, 2021, the California State Auditor released her report on the California State Bar. The cover page reads, the State Bar of California, it is not effectively managing its system for investigating and disciplining attorneys who abuse the public trust. That should be an alarming cover page for every single one of us in this meeting. One of the alarming statistics from the report is, quote, from 2015 through 2020, case processing times for attorney discipline cases increased 56% and the backlog of cases increased 87%, end quote. I hope that each and every one of you reads this report, which demonstrates that our state bar is not effectively handling disciplinary cases. The findings from the audit are something we should all be embarrassed by. If the state bar cannot handle its current slate of ethics complaints against attorneys, how will it manage an increase in caseloads with these new non-lawyers who own law firms and paraprofessionals? If you want to focus on access to justice, Respectfully, perhaps you should look inwardly and fix the state bar's backlog of disciplinary cases and ability to investigate attorneys who abuse public trust. That must be fixed before creating a new class of legal professionals that will only increase the state bar's backlog. For any one of us and any one of you that cares about ethics, even one iota, this must be taken into consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you, next. Um, our last speaker is Beth Mora. Good morning. My name is Beth Mora. Thank you so much for your time. I'm a plaintiff employment attorney, and I'm here speaking on behalf of California Employment Lawyers Association. I've spoken before, and I do hope you take my time and comments seriously as I take your time and comments seriously. I am deeply concerned about the sandbox proposal. Um, currently, one of my significant concerns is immunities. While the intent may be to waive certain regulations on UPL, there should be no safe harbors or immunity for liability for sandbox participants. They should be held liable for any harm they cause workers or consumers, including data breaches and forced arbitration of claims against the sandbox participants should be expressly prohibited. This is something we care deeply about in the worker and consumer setting. We all know that the state bar mandate is to protect the public, not to help evade the law. Unfortunately, the current sandbox proposal does not protect the public. Tech does not need a state regulator to allow it to innovate. Silicon Valley is doing that without state bar innovation. The state bar choosing companies and firms to bend the rules is against its core mission to protect the public. It is not going to give the public faith that everyone must play by the same rules. Some companies will get the benefit of the regulatory exemption and others will not. What I found fascinating by the report is that we're paralleling it to Utah. 
without seeing the benefit of a report that Utah has done well. But hasn't anyone ever looked how different California is to Utah? Let's do a simple analysis. Right now in California, you have 198,804 licensed active attorneys. Right now in Utah, you have 8,285 licensed active attorneys. Look at that number. You have 10 seconds remaining. That isn't even how many different judges or courthouses, different laws and statutes. You cannot compare it. It is not apples to oranges. It isn't even fruits to vegetables. Your time is up. It's not food. Please look at something different. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Were there further public comments, Ms. Yes. Lee? We do have a few more. Um, we're gonna have to, uh, we have five, six people left and we're gonna have to limit it to that um, because we have a full agenda today. So next we'll take Tiffany Howard. We already had Ms. Howard. Oh, sorry, she did it. Lower her hand, one second. Let me lower everyone's hands. Okay, three people. Um, Annette Morash. Hi, my name is Annette Morash. I have spoken at a prior meeting. I am a public interest lawyer. I represent 100% of my clients are low income, indigent or homeless. And somehow I make a living. And if you guys create this sandbox, which I like to refer as a cat box, you're gonna destroy me. I took out $130,000 worth of student loans to help these people. And you guys are going to take my livelihood away. And I've mentioned before that I will send the bar an invoice. And I say before creating some crazy little concoction that you're making, why don't you focus on fixing the existing problems of the bar? I have reported so many attorneys to the bar for unethical behavior and the bar has done nothing, including an attorney down in Orange County who was found guilty of defrauding a minor client by a jury of his peers. He's still practicing. The guy poked a man in the face in an elevator. I saw cocaine on the bottom of his nose as he spit on me. I reported this to the bar, you guys did nothing. Two words, Tom Girardi. Other people that I've run across, paraprofessionals, the people that you want to practice law, stealing $7,500 from an immigrant under the guise of trying to get her papers. I've reported two attorneys to the bar for going behind my back to my monolingual Spanish speaking clients and giving them all English settlement agreements and having them sign them, waiving all their rights, you guys did nothing. So why don't you look at fixing the existing problems rather than adding to it? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morash. Next. Uh, next, we have uh, Jeannie Harrison. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for giving me a couple minutes to speak. I'm Jeannie Harrison, the president of Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles. You received written comment by us, CELA, and CAOC. Um, the sandbox is a terrible idea that specifically contemplates taking risk on consumers. That's the whole purpose of the sandbox, mm. is to take an unmitigated risk on the consumers for new corporations that want to create more profit for themselves. It is the consumers who will be experimented upon. It is the consumers who will be harmed. Um, the bottom line is letting for-profit corporations experiment on consumers. I say it again and again, because that is exactly what is being uh, chosen here, is for-profit corporations experimenting on consumers. And that is inherently antithetical to the purported purpose of the state bar, which is to protect consumers. The, the, the proponents of this, are saying that uh, deregulation is going to improve access to justice. There is zero evidence that it will do so. And in fact, there is evidence from the Boston Consulting Group's report, which studied over 10 years of the model of the deregulated model in England and Wales, 
that the opposite is true. I know you have this report, but nobody's talking about this report. In fact, the report says that consumers did not benefit from increased competition when looking at price, service, quality, and transparency. It did not work based on 10, over 10 years of study. And so I urge you, please put the consumers first, not the for-profit corporations. Absolutely positively require the same obligations at the very least on the corporations that you require of attorneys. You've heard how much there still needs to be done. The prosecutors who have testified in the PPWG have said they don't have sufficient resources to prosecute the people who are in business now and engaging in UPL. Please put the consumers first. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Next. Um, our final speaker is Kevin Murphy. You'll have two minutes. Hi, thank you very much for letting me appear in front of you today and just add, I support all my colleagues former comments to this committee. Um, it, it's mind boggling to me that California being one of the biggest states in the union would even be contemplating entering into a sandbox program such as this. We have way too many consumers who are going to be the subjects and the risk bearers of a program such as this. It, it, it in my understanding completely defies the California bars paramount priority, which is the public protection. Um, we're, we're going to aid for-profit corporations in avoiding regulatory oversight at the risk of those who need legal services the most. I think that the Trump administration's CFPB Sandbox serves as a cautionary tale for California's con contemplated program. And I really hope that this does not go forward. I don't think that this is the time to roll the dice and to hope for the best without adequately planning for the worst. And I, I completely support my colleagues' prior strenuous objections here too. And I thank you all for your time. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ms. Lee, were there other people who have asked to make public comment? Nope, that is our last person. Okay, well, I wanna thank all the individuals who spoke today and also to uh, thank those of you who submitted letters in anticipation of this meeting uh, that we have circulated and reviewed uh, because the committee does value your public comments. Uh, the next agenda item is announcements, and I think that's my uh, opportunity to share just a couple of things with our membership. Um, and I want to start by welcoming our new member, Ms. Lucy Rica, who needs no introduction only because she was previously introduced to all of you when she came to speak to us about the Utah Sandbox, where she uh, was working for, what, a period of a couple, uh, a few years, right, Ms. Rica? Uh, who is on mute right now, but can jump in if she unmutes yes. herself. <laughs> yes. Ms. Rika has since returned to uh, Stanford. We welcome her back to California um, and we welcome her to membership on our committee where she has replaced Bridget Grammy as uh, the member with familiarity with the Atoll's work. That was a slot that Bridget vacated when she joined State Bar staff. So welcome. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we, uh, you all may remember or you may not that we circulated uh, months ago a work plan with some uh, proposed deadlines for when we thought we would have our, our work finished and ready to go out for public comment and so on. Um, and because we are um, working hard but finding it difficult to finish this project, that, uh, that timeline begins to look uh, overly optimistic. So uh, we have begun in, internally among the leadership to say, yeah, I think probably the timeline on that is gonna have to slip um, and we will get back to you next year with, uh, with a timeline that we think will allow us to finish the decisions we need to make um, before we put together a report that goes out for public, what goes out for public comment and to the uh, state bar trustees. Um, 
So with that, the staff report. Thank you, uh, Sticker. Thank you. Just three quick uh, pieces. Um, we apologize for uh, papering you with uh, many uh, circulations prior to the meeting. I wanted to just call out two things from staff that hopefully you will not overlook. One is we have circulated an updated roster uh, of the members, which includes our new member, Lucy Rica. We have also circulated the 2022 uh, meeting schedule, which includes all of the full working group meetings uh, set for 2022. This year is almost done, and hopefully you have already migrated those onto your own personal calendars. Third and last uh, staff item I wanted to mention is a thank you to those members who, again, took the effort to review the posting of the materials ahead of time and to submit uh, written comments. As we've announced previously, uh, members of the working group who submit written comments in advance of the meeting will be the first called on to speak on an item. And in that connection, I want to encourage you to, if you do write in a comment, to specifically refer to that item, whichever it is that you're referring to, so that you can reap that benefit. We, we do uh, value all of the comments given, and we, we also want to give you a chance to address that when those items come up. And that's all we have from staff. Thank you, Randy. And if I can go backwards, there's one thing I forgot to do in my list of announcements. I'm sure everyone is wondering uh, what today's agenda will look like in terms of having a lunch break. Um, and we, you'll see that we have presentations uh, lined up as item C from uh, noon until, sorry, 11.45 to 12.30, I think we're gonna uh, hear from Professor Stacy Butler and from one o'clock to 1.45, uh, from Charlie Moore. So we anticipate today's lunch break being from 1230 to one o'clock. Um, and we will continue in a moment with the uh, business on the agenda until we get to 1145 and then we will will break for the for the presentation. Um, next item on the agenda is approval of the open session action summary from the September 17th meeting. I hope everyone had a chance to review that as it was circulated and I would be open to hearing a motion and a second. A move, move to approve. Thank you, Thank you Toby. I'll second. Thank you, Eric. Unless there is discussion, the motion has been moved and seconded. Okay, I will take the vote. Um, Marta Alkenbrock. Abstain. Uh, Andrew Arita. Judge Irma Asbury. Mary Baldwin. Approve. Judge Wendy Chang. Approve. David Engstrom. Tom Green. Approve. Dan Grenfeld. Approve. Eric Helland. Approve. Kathy Huang. Micah Star Liberty. Approve. John Lund. Approve. Kevin Moore. Wendy Musell? No. Crispin Passmore? Lucy Rica? Approve. I think you abstained because you weren't here for the last meeting. Um, Toby Rothschild? Approve. Becky Sandifer? Approve. Jim Sandman? Approve. Patricia Scatiero? Approve. Sacha Steinberger? Approve. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That uh, approval passed, which brings us to the first agenda item, uh, a discussion and possible action on a subcommittee recommendation for a risk-based approach to regulation for a sandbox. Uh, Mary, John, does one of you wanna kick this off? Sure, uh, thank you, Justice Tucker. Um, so the, we, the first of two SAGE committee items on the agenda is this first one, a uh, 2A recommendation for risk-based approach to regulation for sandbox. And uh, this memo contains five um, recommendations. It basically provides a general framework for a risk-based regulatory approach. Um, most of the, so the first two items in the recommendation are uh, sort of policy frameworks intended to inform admission to the sandbox. Um, the uh, third and fourth are recommendations that address the rules and standards that uh, lawyers 
lawyers participating in the sandbox and then entities participating in the sandbox um, should be held to. And I would note that there's some overlap on uh, item three with, with uh, a memo that SCOPE has put forward that we'll be discussing later, um, just so that you can help uh, sort these through. Uh, and then number five of the recommendation is a proposal that the, work, the working group will separately consider the scope and mechanism of possible rule and or statutory waivers just to make clear that these recommendations do not port to set, to purport to set forth a specific proposal about how any waivers would be made. And it's important to, when you look at this list of recommendations to also read the, the uh, footnotes because these uh, are address and reflect um, significant discussion we had at our committee meeting and hopefully resolve some questions uh, or comments that people had. So um, we've discussed, you know, many of these issues before, uh, and we've we've certainly discussed um, these issues significantly within uh, the Sage Committee, but also here within the, the working group. So, um, with that, I'd like to just open it up for discussion. Um, I know that uh, we got written comments from Wendy uh, Mussel. So, um, John, unless you want to say anything, I will uh, invite uh, Wendy to speak. Okay, I don't hear from John. So, um, Wendy, would you like to speak since you submitted written comments? Thank you. I appreciate um, the opportunity to share my comments. Some of these are, are uh, well known to some of you as I've had some of the same themes uh, throughout the time that I've served on the committee. So one of the first issues that I have is a concern about separation of powers and the role of the legislature and the court and our respective roles. I do note that part of the waivers that are contemplated are Business and Professions Code 6125, and uh, among others. And part of the issue is it appears to me that the sandbox uh, would be uh, proceeding with the regulatory structure or scheme being presented to the legislature. And then what rules would be applying to sandbox participants being approved uh, per applicant so that there would not be upfront what the rules are, which is another issue that I'll go into. Um, this, the state court doesn't have the power uh, or nor do any of we on this committee have the power to waive any statutory authority. That's within the ambit of the legislature. And so any sort of ad hoc uh, rulemaking that waives any statutory basis is a separation of powers problem. Uh, I've indicated that uh, I, the legislature specifically is concerned about this. I am the designee for the legislature. And so I continue to raise this issue because I think the way that we're approaching this is causing a, a separation of powers issues and has some constitutional problems. I did provide, um, which was not passed, a, uh, a different proposal uh, that was rejected. I was the lone no vote um, related to the separation of powers issues. I included it here in my comments. I don't know if you want to put my comments up, but in any event, I did provide uh, edits that I thought um, would address the separation of powers issue, at least in part. So I do ask again that uh, that be reconsidered um, by the CJTG. Uh, another major issue that uh, I have is what and thank you, I'll, I'll slow down for, for my comments to populate. So there's a separation of powers issue. I encourage you all to read it. I will state very plainly that this is an issue that the legislature is concerned about. And um, the content of this area uh, is not just my work product. So I just want to be really transparent about that. Um, so if you scroll down, you'll see uh, the legal framework, why I raise these issues. And then if you scroll down, my proposal uh, to change the language such that it would address the respective uh, powers of the courts 
and the legislature and honors both. Um, again, this was uh, rejected. I was the lone no vote, but I encourage everyone to revisit this issue. It is never too late. Uh, the second issue is mission creep. Um, I understood the mission of what we're supposed to be doing here is to address access to, de of what access to, to justice. To address access Oops. That's okay. Um, for low income Californians and historically underserved communities. We were not um, tasked with figuring out how to make money for tech companies. We were not tasked to figure out how uh, small businesses or corporations could make money. Um, and so I've been concerned about the mission creep, which is also in the documents today where it indicates it would predominantly serve low income and moderate income folks. I'm not sure what moderate income means within the state of California. I know low income has very defined uh, depending upon which uh, legislative or statutory basis you're pulling from, but there are definitions for low income folks. I'm not sure what we're talking about when we get to moderate income. It also, in the documents today, there was references to tech companies and businesses. Um, that was not in our mission. So my, my concern overall is uh, we there's been talk about innovation as well, and innovation for tech companies to basically, if we're gonna use uh, Silicon Valley speak to come disrupt the legal um, uh, you know, area. And I don't think that's what we need. I think we need to make sure that consumers are served we need to make sure that low income folks can get access um, to justice and get access to attorneys or legal services. Um, and I think we need to make sure that underserved, historically underserved communities are actually served. I think where we're, we're going astray, I think that um, the way that I perceive this to be going is we would be allowing um, tech companies uh, to, uh, for example, practice law without being subject to the same uh, rules as the rest of us. I think that's uh, an unintended uh, mission, meaning this is not what we're supposed to be doing here. Um, and so I have deep concerns about that. The next area I have deep concerns about is funding, which if you scroll down, I don't know how we intend to pay for all of this. Um, I know that the discussion has been to ask for money from the general fund. I don't know if there's been any communications with the legislature, if so, I'm unaware of it, about how realistic that is um, to get a large chunk of the uh, general fund in order to start a new regulatory agency, particularly where there would have to be administrative folks many of which who may be the same people who work for the state bar or have job duties related to the state bar. So in essence, it's paying double. That's a concern. Um, I also worry for funding for those folks who are participants, uh, what would the uh, price of admission be? And I know that there's some discussion about that today, but I think we really have to look at how are we paying for all of this? How are we going to be paying for people to uh, regulate? Um, there's a lot of things that we've been discussing about how we're gonna in the future be able to evaluate whether these participants in the sandbox are not harming consumers um, after the fact, of course. Um, but how are we gonna pay for those people? Are we gonna, how are we gonna pay for those staff members? Uh, how are we gonna pay for the offices? How are we gonna pay for the paper? <laughs> I mean, um, so I'm, I'm concerned about funding, particularly when the court system is underfunded um, right now and certainly could benefit by additional funding. Um, and I, I'm mindful of some of the comments uh, that uh, I've been hearing from the public regarding um, the efficacy 
current efficacy of oversight. I do think we need to look at the current efficacy of oversight to make sure that we're not duplicating any areas that we ought to be um, remedying. The other uh, area that I have a deep concern about is the standard of care. The standard of care, which was passed, um, again, I was the lone no vote, is a standard of care as if the consumer had no legal representation. And I think that that's really important for the public to understand um, this issue. That is not a recognized legal standard of care and it's not a standard at all, in my opinion. Um, we do have very clear standard of care for legal malpractice that's already enshrined in law. Um, and I included our jury instruction that was passed by the Judicial Council jury instruction number 600, which uh, indicates what the standard of care is and also provided some case law regarding the standard of care. My concern is for consumers, if there's really no real standard of care, then it, it means that um, consumers are, are definitely going to be harmed here. I can't think of any other regulatory agency that would approve having no standard of care. It, it literally makes no sense to me. Um, additionally, I worry about our court system. So what happens when we have consumers who are harmed and then they go to court? What's the standard that our judges are supposed to utilize in order to make a determination? Is this in really a de facto immunity? If you have no standard of care, you're really creating immunity. Um, for those that um, harm consumers. And so, again, I would ask that we, re we revisit this issue. It doesn't make sense to me that we would have a standard of care, which is as if the consumer had no legal representation. It, in essence, um, is a backdoor way to get rid of basic ethical duties. If you have no standard of care, how are you going to, even if you say we're going to apply all the ethical duties that apply to attorneys, if there is no standard of care, then what is that really? Does that really mean that in practice that you're um, doing away with all of the uh, ethical rules, or at least some of them? Uh, it, it just seems to be on a substantive and practical level, uh, completely um, undoable. My next area of concern, if you can scroll down, I would appreciate it, is the ad hoc rulemaking. And this goes uh, up to the area as well with the separation of powers issue. As I understand um, the current plan, is that an applicant will put an application to the sandbox. The applicant will state what rules they think need to be waived in order for their business proposition to go forward. At that point, the regulatory agency designee would decide on his or her subjective um, decision-making whether the rules that were identified or other rules would be waived. I'm unaware of any other regulatory agency that functions in that way. I don't think that's a functioning regulatory environment. Um, I think ad hoc rulemaking causes much more harm to consumers. It doesn't give notice to consumers regarding what rules apply. It also raises issues of if I'm hiring an attorney, or if I'm hiring, let's say, a paraprofessional, paralegal, um, will I be told what rules apply? Uh, will I understand what that means up front? Will I understand what the difference in the standard of care means up front? How are these things going to be communicated to the public? I think these are major issues. Uh, I also think for the ad hoc rulemaking, Again, we can't waive statutory basis on the back end. Um, that's a violation of separation of powers. The 
Next area I have concerns about is the lack of oversight to the detriment of consumers. Um, I have raised these issues before, but I have concerns about deregulation as it relates to trust accounts, to conflicts issues, to confidentiality, and to um, the commodification of client data. These are areas that are an anthem to the practice of law that as attorneys, it's 101. These are areas that you do not violate or you're definitely gonna lose your law license. Um, so I have deep concerns that these are areas that uh, would be waived. Um, the proposed areas of uh, waiver of rules appears expansive and not narrowly tailored to address the mission of access to justice, particularly access to justice for those that are the most vulnerable in um, our society. I also think it's a major problem to contemplate waiver of rules after the fact. Um, regarding the area of commodification of consumer data, previously there was discussion about this and my understanding of where this, the sandbox, uh, you know, the access to justice working group uh, landed is that there would not be sharing or selling of consumer data in any form to third parties. I would want verification that that's the case and that's really the direction we're going. If that's the direction we're going, I wholly support it. I do not think there should be any sharing or selling of consumer data in any form to, to third parties. I can't imagine a more um, terrible way to address the practice of law than to, for example, commodify my client's medical records, their personal records. Um, we see clients at some of their worst times in life. Um, we're supposed to help them through that. My clients that I see, they contact me when, um, you know, they've been subjected to sexual assault, sexual harassment, um, things of that nature and are fired, for example, for complaining. Am I going to take their medical records and commodify that. I mean, to me, that is another victimization of clients that are already vulnerable. Uh, so if we have landed on the, sh the not sharing or selling of consumer data, then I applaud that. If not, I think um, we need to revisit that decision. Additionally, I think there are unintended consequences regarding the interaction with other laws and constitutional protections, which is number seven. Um, there are particular, as many of us who are practicing law in California are well aware, the California Constitution, Article One, Section One, um, does cover things like personnel records, uh, medical records. They are uh, entitled to a heightened. Um, right to privacy. There are other areas that are similarly governed by heightened um, right to privacy, such as uh, financial records. There are other statutory bases that uh, prohibit uh, disclosing these areas. And it's unclear to me whether the way that the sandbox is being, um, pers you know, where we're going is whether these would create uh, violations with other laws or statutory protections. So for example, if we allow sharing or selling of consumer data, then we're gonna run afoul of constitutional protections um, that are already enshrined in California law. Additionally, I don't have any understanding of why we'd wanna do that, why that would be any in consumer, uh, uh, that would help the consumers at all. I also uh, really do take to heart these public statements um, that have been made by organizations um, for which my perception is they're not being taken as seriously as we, as we need to. For example, Ms. Howard had raised um, a report regarding the oversight for, uh, from the Cal State Auditor um, I would like to hear more about that and how we intend to address that in, in the creation of a new regulatory agency so that some of the same issues 
um, would not populate there. Ms. Mora raised issues regarding immunity for sandbox participants. I think that's extremely important. Um, also areas of data breaches, arbitration um, not being available and raising issues that Utah is untested and California is not Utah. Um, Ms. Harrison raised a, a report regarding the Boston Consulting Group regarding some issues in the UK system um, where consumers were not benefited. I'd like to see uh, more about that, learn more about that. Uh, we also, uh, Mr. Murphy raised issues regarding a sandbox that was contemplated recently in the last administration regarding financial services. I think those are all instructive to us and I would like to hear more about those. Uh, I know I have more, but I know I have tested all of your patience and time. So I appreciate uh, your patience and listening to um, my comments. Okay, thank you. Um, I do just wanna point out that what we have on our instant agenda right here is the you know specific item uh, 2A, which is the these five recommendations. And I just want to point out that many of your comments go beyond the scope of you know these five. One of the comments that you made, which I do want to just address, is uh, your comment about the standard of care. You raise you know very important uh, points about. Um, the, if there was no standard of care, that would be detrimental to consumers. And you've made these points before and, and very effectively. I just want to point out that uh, to the extent that you are addressing recommendation two here, um, this recommendation two is only for purpose of admission to the sandbox. And we clarified this in, a, in footnote um, one. This is not intended, expressly not intended to set forth the standard of care and it, it will not operate to, to limit liability or in any way define attorney liability. So I just wanna make that clear to the extent that, that you know, I, I understand that this is a concern of yours and it's a valid concern, but this item two does not uh, intend to or purport to set forth a standard of care. That'll be something that we will be taking up separately and, and thank you for raising that. Uh, Justice Tuker. Uh, thank you. I want to make some of the same points, but also to uh, just comment as a matter of procedure that perhaps what would be useful is to uh, have a, pro a, a proposal made, a, a motion made, uh, and I would ask that it be one at a time rather than as a package deal um, so that we have an opportunity to have an up or down vote on each of your five recommendations. Um, then I also, on the subject of the Boston Consulting Group report, uh, Wendy, you may not know this, but before you joined the committee, we did circulate that report and some commentary that uh, was published after the report um, to all members. And those are available on our uh, OneDrive website for your review and further study. And I commend uh, both to you. Okay, uh, and, and Justice Tucker, absolutely, we're intending to proceed by way of a, a, a motion, and we can certainly take up each of these separately. Um, uh, I just wanted to get any inter introductory comments, but if somebody, if a member wishes to make a motion at this point, that's, that's fine with me as a way to proceed here. Um, John, you have your hand up next. Uh, I'll, I'll turn to you and, and if you wanna make a proposal or a motion, that's fine. And, but uh, I know you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, I, I, I guess I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. So I'm not gonna try to go point by point through some of the things that Wendy was addressing, but I, I just, I, I, think, I think we've got to reset on this point about the mission. And, and um, Crispin really did that in his materials, Wendy, I don't know if you've looked at his public comments, but he's specifically pulling out the charter. And the charter really does deal with a couple of these things that, that you continue to raise. And so I, I guess I just think, you know, if you don't agree with the charter, you know, that's fine, but it spells out rather clearly in there, the working group charter, and he cites the portion that we're supposed to be exploring the development of a sandbox, A, and B, to evaluate changes to the rules and laws that inhibit the development of innovation. And then it says, such as consumer facing technology that provides legal advice and services directly to clients at all income levels. 
all income levels. Ultimately, if you read the rest of it, it talks about considering relaxation of the rules, including laws about unauthorized practice of law. And it says at the very end of the charter that the guiding principle is to balance the dual goal of ensuring public protection and increasing access to justice for all Californians. So I, I guess I just respectfully disagree that there's mission creep anytime we talk about something other than the low income people in California. It's very clear to me from this charter that our scope is about innovation that will increase access to legal services for all Californians. I do have, I guess, a bit of a, a common view with you or concern that we get it right about the, the separation of powers issue. And, and, I, and, I, and I guess I just, I wanna at least defer to those of you who are who are more attuned to this issue, but just to highlight it, your, your narrative and the, the, the proposed language you, you suggest, I guess the question is, is the Supreme Court's primary authority regulating the practice of law, whoever's doing it, or is the Supreme Court's constitutional authority about only lawyers? And I think it's the former, not the latter, but I think that warrants being sure we get that right. It's clear to me that, that nothing should be happening in the sandbox that doesn't involve the practice of law. And it's clear to me it's gonna be a mix in most cases of lawyers and non-lawyers doing that in some collaborative way. So at least I continue to think we have it right the way the recommendation is worded that, that, that focuses on the Supreme Court being the primary regulator of the practice of law. But if there's, a, um, if there's a constitutional scholar among us that can straighten that out, then uh, I think that's important to have straight. And then the last thing I'll say is, it's just as the charter suggests, it's just endemic to the idea of a sandbox that some rules are going to be relaxed. That's the whole point is to allow that to happen and try to have innovation and see if it helps people. And lastly, the people I think about that we're helping are, are, are not the people who currently have a lawyer. They're not the people that even the consumer laws, the consumer lawyer attorneys represent. It's this wide, wide swath. And to the extent California is bigger than Utah, it just means there's that many multiples more people who aren't being received, aren't receiving any service at all that are the focus of this, more so than the ones that are able to find a lawyer in some fashion. So I'll stop there uh, and, you know, Mary, if and when you want a motion, just say so. Okay, well, we'll run through a few more comments, but I, I do wanna try to keep us focused on these five recommendations that are before us. And I understand that, you know, there may be some interest in revisiting past resolutions already passed, you know, with, with all, you know, I, I just wanna keep for right now on my agenda, are these five recommendations and you know so that's that, what i would that like sounds to, to me mary on. like a request for a motion it, that sure i will move it's also a, it's, but also justice Tuker, it, it kind of also is a request that to the extent we continue to discuss you know have our discussion here on these agenda items that we limit our discussion to these agenda items otherwise we'll never get anything done so, and with that, I'll, I'm happy to entertain a, a motion if anyone wants to make one. Uh, Becky? I just have a question. Um, so, so, first I wanna say thank you to Mary and to John and to the committee for putting together these very thoughtful recommendations that are, that are identifying the risks that the sandbox would be monitoring. Um, and then that monitoring would happen with facts right? That's how sandboxes work. And so I just said, this is really honestly just a question and it relates to the recommendation 1C. So I can think in my social science mind of different ways to identify whether a service is unnecessary. Like you could have a panel of lawyers review what happened and they would say, no, that was a completely unnecessary trust that you recommended or whatever. But I would, I would really appreciate I mean, in, in, a, in a spirit of curiosity, hearing from the committee, just sort of a summary of its thought about an inappropriate amount. I mean, I don't wanna, I don't wanna put Eric Helland on the spot, but, but I think he's an economist and he may have some, some in, insights here. But if you look at 
If you look at legal services markets where lawyers are providing services, the very same service can be provided at a very different price point, um, a massively different price point, like 500% different price point, depending on where you're purchasing it and how it's produced and those kinds of things. And so just sort of how the committee's thinking about what that, how we know it was appropriate or inappropriate, that's all. And before I, we, and Eric, if you want to address that, raise your hand. I, I'll just point out this, this your, Becky, you framed your question as a sort of retrospective. How do we determine that it was inappropriate? That's not the purpose of, of item one. This is for purpose of admission. This is a, a risk framework that we apply at the front end to decide if someone's going to, your question still has validity, but it's not a, it's not a backward looking one. Uh, that's not how this is intended to operate if that clarifies one piece of your question. Uh, Eric? So Becky, the way I was thinking of this was actually not amount as an amount you pay. I think that would be very hard for a, a sandbox entity or any entity to decide what the right price was. I think it was if you examined something where it appeared that it would be something like upselling would be automatic. So you would just have a much broader scope of services offered in the sandbox business model. So imagine we, you know, we, we had a system where we offered you a, a menu of services and you looked at them and said, it's unlikely a consumer would need to buy all of that as a package. So I think, I think when we met amount, what we were really thinking was less the price you paid for those services, which I agree with you. I, I, we shouldn't be regulating that and, and I don't see how we possibly could, but I think the more appropriate one was a concern of, of sort of bundling uh, these in ways that, that again, that the uh, regulatory agency looked at and thought was inappropriate. So I, that's a that's a short answer to your question. I'm happy to do a follow up. So uh, is there a motion, uh, Toby? I would move the adoption of item one. I'll second. Okay, so now we can have discussion on that proposal, which is to approve recommendation one as set forth in this memo. Uh, Wendy? I had actually similar questions as Ms. Sandifer. Uh, how is there any sort of determination of an unnecessary legal service or an inappropriate legal service? Um, it seems if we're using that as a standard, we should have definitions and uh, understand what those mean. Um, it, it would seem that <laughs> I have no idea how that would function in reality. Um, I could see if someone told you, you that they wanted assistance with filing a temporary restraining order, and then you're uh, selling them legal services related to immigration where they have no need, that's pretty clear. But if you have, let's say, someone needs a will, and then you're providing them with, uh, I don't do trust in the state, as you obviously can tell, um, you know, things related to choices at end of life, that seems to be uh, consistent with uh, what a competent attorney would be raising. So, uh, so I had questions about how, how those would be determined, because if it's going to be one of the application criteria, I think, I think we should have that um, further defined. Okay, thank you, Tom Green. Hi, uh, yeah, I think, um, I wanna make sure here that we are not in, agreeing to number one, that we're essentially adopting the whole Utah structure. I mean, Utah has this structure which basically focuses on potential consumer harm, and then they have a system of risk-based assessments of the kinds of providers that would create potential problems. I think with respect to that second piece, um, as I have mentioned to you previously, I think we need a further discussion of what those risk factors look like. So the, the question I have to you, Mary and John, is number one, we are not agreeing to the Utah structure, number one, and two, that we will still have the opportunity to provide input and we'll discuss the risk factors that may uh, potentially affect uh, inaccurate, in particular, inaccurate and inappropriate legal services. Do you have answers so, to those questions? Uh, yes. So item uh, 2B on the agenda is the evaluation for proactive regulation and monitoring of sandbox providers. That's that extensive memo. And there's a, there's a 
elaboration of risk factors. Um, that's a separate agenda item, which will, which will follow this, which is intended to uh, go to uh, part of what you've just raised. Okay. So have you reviewed those? I mean, does that address your, did you, did you feel like what you've raised is not addressed in, in that agenda item? I think my focus here, Mary, is I don't agree with those risk factors as they're articulated in that memo. Mm. And then the other question, yet another But we can, question. but you want, we'll have plenty of time to discuss that when we get to that. I mean, this, I yeah. just want to clarify this agenda item, this proposal, number one, is separate from that. And if that's not clear, I, I just, I want to make sure that is clear. Okay. And then- Can I jump in on that? Answer, answer that real quick. Or Tom, is that, is your second comment still about number- the, the four items in number one, or did you have something else to say on that before I respond? Well, I think it's the, it's the other side of this analysis that I think is really the, the interesting one from a regulatory perspective. I do have another question, which is um, we described here that the purpose of this process is to make sure that consumers get a presumably accurate and appropriate legal services, yet we have in two, which I, I, I actually quite agree with Wendy on actually, if this is what this means. Um, I think that we do need as a uh, entry criteria that the sandbox candidate provides at least a facial uh, presentation with respect to the competence of the services being provided, but that may be more of a item two issue, so. But is there some relationship between 1A and 2? Uh, do you mind if I respond? To sure, that? Bridget. Okay, and somebody else that, you know, feel free to jump in that has expertise in the risk-based regulation. But the way that these, that we talked about this and SAGE and how we've kind of teed these up for the first item, number one, which is what we're focusing on right now, is really just trying to take a step back from everything and think about what is it that we're worried about happening? Not, not criteria for entry, not of that. We're just thinking about when, what are the risks to consumers that we are worried about and set everything else aside. And so what we're trying to capture here is what are we worried about? We're worried that they're gonna get the wrong service, that they're going to, you know, not, they're gonna get bad advice and they're not going to be able to exercise the rights that they should be able to exercise, um, that they get sold something that they don't need or they're charged too much. Mm -hmm. Um, or that they experience fraud. So these are, this is really meant to be a framework for assessing all the other risks that we're going to be talking about. I mean, the, the risk criteria is something that we're gonna talk about in the next segment, but this is about what are we worried about for consumers? What are we worried about protecting them from? And so if there are things that you think we should add or things that you think, that you think should be modified as we describe them here, we try to just kind of think of the universe of things that we're worried about. That's what item one is supposed to be. When we get to two, we can talk about two, but it is definitely not meant to be a standard of care. It's a separate issue as we talked about in the footnote, but for one right now, it's really the focus is what are we worried about on behalf of consumers? So how do we articulate the risks that they may face from sandbox providers? Okay, so I, I, not to put everybody on the spot here, but so we're not adopting Utah with any of this. We're just on, with respect to one A through D, that's the focus of the danger we want, dangers that we want to uh, identify, right? We're not adopting any part of Utah yet or at all. Is that correct? Number one is just what, yes, what are we worried? What do we want okay. to protect consumers from? Right, Emma, does anyone else disagree with me on that? Okay. Uh, Toby? Yeah, I uh, just wanted to comment in response to, I guess, Wendy's comments and others that this is a framework. This is not a final product in terms of what the whole process will be. And I think the same will come up repeatedly in the other issues we're gonna deal with. So I don't think it's necessary upfront at this stage to define what is a necessary legal, unnecessary legal services or an inappropriate amount or some of these other things to, I think we need to say that's the concept we want to focus on. And as we move through, we will get to defining that. And that same issue will come up later with defining uh, low and moderate income and all the other specific you know, sort of topics that we're going to raise. I think they need to say, 
this is this is the framework, and as we move through, that, that gives us a place then that we can focus our attention as we move along. Okay, thank you, Crispin. Thanks, Mary. I, I, I support uh, the direction in this. Um, yeah, in the end, regulation is a real world issue. It's about what are we going to add to general law, um, the normal law that applies in any particular market to deal with specific problems that exist in this market that don't exist elsewhere in our economy, whether that's goods or services. So regulation is about putting something extra in place. And when we look at the legal market, the real world problem in the legal market isn't um, people running off with money. It isn't bad quality advice. They do happen and they need to be dealt with. But the big problem in the economy, the big problem, whether you're low income, middle income, high income, whether you're small business or big business, the big issue in California, as in every other state, as in every other modern Western rich jurisdiction around the world, the big issue is that too many people cannot get the help they need with the problems that they face in their life, their business, their economic life, their social life, their private life. So we've got to make sure that what we do here is regulate in a way that tackles that harm. That's not a theoretical harm, that's an everyday harm. Every month that we take, to discuss this, there's another bunch of women that flee domestic violence that don't get help. There's another bunch of people that are homeless that don't get help to stay in their home or to find a new home. They're not theoretical harms, they're real harms happening every single day to real people. And therefore we've got to make sure that we do not put anything in the way of new innovations, whether they're technology, designs of businesses, whether they include great lawyers with great ideas, and I know there's millions of them around the world, we've got to make sure that none of the regulation that we put in, put in place in this sandbox gets in the way of those sorts of changes. It should be the bare minimum that is needed. So the only thing that I would really add into this, um, but I think it's it, it doesn't need to be really written into it because it's it's just core to the charter is you know the real harm here is no legal advice rather than inappropriate or too expensive um or risks of fraud the real risk here is no legal services at all um but given that way it's structured i, I support what we've got and i'd quite like us to get on with it okay uh marta thank you um one of the, since we're, we're looking at the risks of harm to consumer, I, what I'm missing is something that the provider is not competent to provide the legal services that they promise to be rendering to the consumer. And so I don't, I don't necessarily see that here. And I think the standard of care issue is really important and appropriate to discuss within this framework. Um, but I, I'm not seeing anything to Tom's point relative to competence demonstrated by the participant um, that is uh, applying for admission into the sandbox. And the other thing that I'm concerned about has to do with part C um, that the consumer receives an unnecessary legal service or pays an inappropriate amount for legal services. I'm aware of some legal service providers that are operating that um, deal that the consumer pays like a subscription agreement and they're paying a relatively low cost that's automatically being deducted from their um, accounts every month. And um, while that might be uh, relatively inexpensive. There's all sorts of uh, room for fraud with respect to those types of agreements. And so while, you know, it may be a low cost, it may not be appropriate in any shape or form. So I'm concerned that while C may sound quote unquote good, um, it could be ripe for fraud. Um, and we're allowing it by allowing these individuals into the sandbox. So those are my immediate comments. Um, and I, so anyway, and I don't, and so I'm confused with respect to, and maybe 
with jumping back just a half a step to the standard of care issue, um, I don't know if that's one or two, but I think that that should be that com general competence of the person providing the service needs to be in here somewhere. And I'm just not necessarily seeing it. Thank you. John. Marta, I wonder if I could maybe just address that in the context of, you know, applicants that, that we've seen. I, I think I've mentioned these Timpanogos domestic abuse advisors before who are social workers. So an entity comes to us. It's a nonprofit. They're, they're providing, you know, guidance with social workers. And their proposal to us at the outset is we'd like to train these social workers and have a certification for them. And then once we're comfortable that they're certified and we are lawyers, you know, it's Timpanogos legal lawyers overseeing that, then they'd be the ones providing this, this narrow legal advice to abuse victims. Now, I guess the question, I guess the way I look at that is those lawyers are taking the responsibility to be sure that those people are properly trained to do what they're doing. I don't think we wanted to get the sandbox in the business of needing to verify that that social worker is properly trained before they can even begin to do the process. So are we getting some comfort level that there's going to be competent oversight by licensed lawyers? Yes. Are we requiring them to demonstrate that they have a full-blown certification program for those social workers before they're even allowed to enter in the in, into the sandbox? No. Do we expect that they nevertheless would provide competent advice, you know, in the context of those, of those services that we're providing. Yes, of course. Uh, but I don't know that them, so I'm not sure in the, in that context, what amounts to demonstrating competency at the front end for individuals. If, if you know, I, it's in there, it's just probably not in there in the way that it is for a lawyer who has to take a bar exam. Um, okay, so let's have a few more comments, and I would like to move to a vote on this first on the pending motion. Uh, Eric. So, so after assuring Wendy that this, uh, sorry, after assuring uh, uh, Becky that this didn't say uh, uh, about uh, fee amounts. Now I'm rereading this and thinking maybe it does say, uh, you know, something about regulating fee amounts. So I, I guess one question to, you know, the comment that was just made is, do we want to just make this an unnecessary legal service and drop the the, the price portion of this, right? That, that in effect, you know, the, the regulator wouldn't be in a position necessarily to know what the, the appropriate sort of fee for this was, but that, you know, it, it would be able to see a business model that looked as if it was upselling or something like that. So I just, I throw that out as a, I don't know, not an amendment or anything, but just, I, I think I'm correcting something I said earlier. Okay, uh, Lucy. Uh, well, not having been a member of this group, um, but having helped construct these uh, similar language um, in the context of Utah, the, the question of competence is dealt with in A and B. Um, it's, it's a reframing of what we traditionally understood of, as competence in the context of the regulation of lawyers, the regulation of, role, of the role of lawyers, into a framing of quality of service. Right? And so when we think about what we're worried about with regard to quality of service, we're worried that the consumer might receive an inaccurate or inappropriate legal service because of a failure of quality or what we understand traditionally as competence. We're worried that the lawyer or the provider might fail to spot a legal issue. That is an issue of quality. And by putting it in this language, we state what the outcome is that we want to see, right? or that we want to avoid. We want to state it really clearly that you know, specifically what we're talking about instead of a general term around competency are these particular harms. But those are harms that result from a failure of quality or a failure of competence. Um, but I think the, the word competence sort of um, is more appropriate when thinking about sort of the upfront uh, uh, qualification that applies to an individual who has to kind of go through an exam and go through law school and take a test, whereas this framing allows it to be measured on the back end quite clearly and explicitly. So that's um, A and B, I think, reflect uh, competence directly in, in the terms of quality. Um, Tom? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, um, I, A through D, is there some reason that 
protection of consumer privacy is not an E. Is that something you guys don't want to consider here or what? Uh, I mean, I think this isn't intended to really address every single risk. And I think that, um, and I mean, consumer privacy is certainly an important issue and there's a lot of room to put in protections for consumer privacy and consumer data as we move forward. Um, so I, I think that's one reason. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to address that. I'd just point out the language abuse of trust would seem to include uh, violated okay. privacy. Okay. Can I just add to that as well? Sure, yeah. Christine. Yeah, Tom, I think the key is that this is not a set of standards for, for, for entrance to the sandbox to live up to. This is about what are the things that are most likely to go wrong when we bring in um, innovative tech-led commercial legal services into this into this market. And I think A to D sets out you know, at a pretty broad level what those key risks are by making this liberalization measure in this market. But it's not instead of a set of standards that apply to them. And down the line, we will need to have a clear set of standards and, you know, not overcharging, looking after um, private information, all of the normal things that we would expect. And of course, all the things that exist in law will need to be echoed at the right point. But at the moment, this is design of a, is a regulatory issue, not a standards issue. And they're different, I think. So I don't think you oh, need it. Let me, let me push back very briefly on that, Crispin, because I, I, it, there may be two ways to handle this. One is, or three, one is abuse of trust um, would cover privacy concerns. I mean, the, the scope committee has said that we need to level up and make sure there's no commercialization of private information. Obviously, um, many, many technology firms sell people's data as part of their business model. So I can certainly see uh, the addition here being perfectly consistent with harms that we want to avoid. But, but if this is not preclusive, this does not foreclose what the scope subcommittee is proposing, which is this information stays private and that's um, a condition of entry basically, um, then I'm okay with one. Tell me how to, how to vote. This, I, and I, I'll just address that. This is not intended to limit, for example, and I think this is basically what Crispin just said, you know, additional regulation that would address, for example, how providers can use uh, consumer data um, going forward. Does anybody disagree with that? Okay. No. All right, John. You're on mute. I was just going to say, I mean, I hate to, hate to prolong this, but I, I, I'd be comfortable referencing loss of privacy in sub D as well, just as, just as a piece that, that's part of it, you know, and, and uh, then it's more explicit and we don't need to read that into abuse of trust, uh, but I, I could go either way on that. If that felt, you know, Tom, if that made you feel more comfortable addressing that, I, I, I'd be okay, but I don't have the pending motion Toby does, so. <laughs> yeah, that would help a lot for me, for sure. Uh, Toby, I'm fine, but I'm fine with including that. Okay, so the the proposed amendment would be fraud, theft, abuse of privacy, or loss of privacy, loss of privacy, or abuse of trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. All right, uh, I would like to close discussion and and proceed to a vote. Um, okay, Wendy. Is there any way that we could take these A, B, C, and D? Because with the amendment on D, I would agree to D. But I, I look at this like I look at legislation that I'm helping to draft, where if if there's no definitions, then for me, it's a blank check, something I can't agree to. But the, uh, the, the way that that was just articulated in D, I certainly could. So I wondered if uh, the motion, if if you would be open to 
um, having a vote on, on the subsections of one. Well, why don't we see how the, the pending motion um, does and if we need to then break it out, why don't we do that? So with that, why don't we uh, call for a vote on the, the pending motion? Okay, so the motion is to recommend, uh, no, approve recommendation one as revised and as it appears on the screen. Yes. Uh, Marta Alkenbrock. Andrew Arruda. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't vote, approve. Okay, Andrew Arruda. Judge Irma Asbury. Mary Baldwin. Yes. Judge Wendy Chang. Yes. David Engstrom. Tom Green. Yes. Dan Grunfeld? Yes. Eric Helland? Yes. Kathy Huang? Micah Star Liberty? No. John Lund? Yes. Kevin Moore? Wendy Musell? No. Kristen Passmore? Yes. Lucy Rica? Yes. Toby Rothschild? Yes. Becky Sandifer? Yes. Jim Sandman? Yes. Patricia Scutiero. Yes. Sacha Steinberger. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, now, well, that was easy. Now we just have four more. Um, is there a motion uh, with respect to uh, number two? Uh, so moved. Second. Second. Okay. Um, so discussion on number two. Uh, and again, I just want to remind everyone this is not the standard of care. We've clarified that the standard of care, meaning the standard by which civil liability will be measured is something that we have yet to address and will address moving forward. So with that, uh, Wendy. I still have concerns about the standard of care. Uh, if the admission to the sandbox is a risk of harm to consumers should be measured relative to the experience that the consumer would have had absent any legal services. To me, that is no standard of all, whether it's utilized for liability purposes or for entrance purposes. Um, John? Well, it, it may not seem like a standard to you, but that's the reality. That's what many of these folks are otherwise dealing with. So I, to me, I guess the question is, if not this test, what would the test be? Would the test be uh, for purposes of admission, the risk of harm to consumers should be measured relative to what they would get if they had $5,000 in the bank and, and could pay a lawyer to give them advice. They, they don't have that, Wendy. And that's, that's to me, the, the heart of this. It, we've got to have a test against where they really are in the world, which I guess just seconds what Chrisman was saying about the, the, the need here is for the people who don't have legal representation at all. And that's why I think this has to be the standard. Uh, Tom? Yeah, I don't think the footnote really helps me. I mean, I think, uh, so I'll try and be crisp about this. I think a standard of admission has to be a demonstration that the service is competent or merchantable, uh, pick your phrase, but it has to be something that responds to the request made by the consumer and is consistent with folks getting some reasonable kind of service. I mean, this thing seems to invite, you know, if, if, you, if you can't afford certain things, then we can give you anything. I mean, that, that can't be what we're endorsing here. So I think um, the footnote is interesting, but I think we need, and I believe we have already agreed to, competency being a mandatory requirement of entry into the sandbox, full stop. Well, we this, and I just want to point out, you know, absolutely, but number two is not out of context. We've just approved number one, which had all of the specific provisions, which included, um, it didn't say competence, as we've just spent time discussing, but does have these other um, criteria, which would encompass competency, including appropriateness of service and all of that. So I just want to make clear that number two is not somehow taken out of context in relation to number one. Uh, Micah? 
I, I agree with Tom and Wendy, and I, I don't think the absence of legal services is any sort of standard. Um, I also have to say, I find it troubling when comments are made directly to a speaker and um, everyone, no one should ever feel silenced in this process and reference uh, repeated reference to whether or not someone read materials, I think is inappropriate. Everyone has a voice. I encourage everyone to continue to exercise that voice and any comments that could be seen to have a chilling effect on them, um, I think are inappropriate. Thanks. Um, Wendy? Uh, I would just reiterate uh, both what, what um, Micah has stated as well as Tom. Um, there's no other area of law that I'm aware of or that anyone has post has uh, identified regarding consumer protections where the consumer has no protections at all. Uh, I think this is uh, going completely in the wrong direction. And, and I, I, I hesitate to raise um, the comments made directly to me or, or it appears attempting to silence me, I mean, it's, I'll just keep making my comments, but I, I do want you all to know that it is landing that way. So I would appreciate the personalization of comments to, to um, cease. Uh, Marta? I, I echo uh, Wendy, Micah and Tom's comments. Um, the one, I, 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 I fear with this program, we're developing a two-tiered system, a, tier, a, a system for which people who can afford lawyers get one level of service and those who cannot get a, get a separate level. And if we don't have any type of demonstration of competence with respect to the legal services being delivered by a sandbox participant, then I don't know what we're doing. Um, and I don't know that they're incorporated with re, into the, uh, the A, B, C, and D points from number one, I think we have to have some type of competence that's demonstrated. So um, even in a post hoc evaluation, which it's frightening in and of itself, but in that post hoc evaluation, at least we can um, know whether or not that was demonstrated at the outset. Um, in, in the plan that's being uh, put forth in the application as to the delivery of legal services, I'm really troubled by the fact that this is not part of the initial recommendation with respect to admission um, into the sandbox and with respect to assessing the risk of the harm to the consumer. Um, that is uh, troubling. Uh, Tom, is your hand still up? Oh, sorry. No, it's not. Okay. okay, just wanted to clarify. Uh, Crispin? Thanks. Um, I could possibly, if it's useful, propose a, a way of trying to sort of square this circle. Um, I'm not sure quite how we have the dialogue that I think is really important here if we don't respond to each other. Um, and I don't know how I respond to the points that are made without suggesting I'm personalising them. I'm not I'm not intending to personalize them. I think they're all really important points, but I don't want it just to be us all taken in terms of making statements. I think the dialogue and understanding each other is really, really important. Um, so, so for me, when I read this, I, I think it's 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 important for me to stand back and say, what is it we're trying to say here? And I don't think we're trying to set a standard of service that any sandbox entrance delivers to customers. If we were, I suspect we might find that there's quite a lot of common ground that it needs to be competent. It obviously needs to um, comply with any other laws and it needs to be better than vaguely competent. In, yeah, it needs to be more than that. But I don't think that's what we're trying to do here. I think what we're trying to do is say, what sort of services do we want in the sandbox? And we want services that are better than no service at all. Well, to be better than no service at all, they do need to be at least some level of competence, but we're not setting that level of competence here in this paragraph. So I wonder whether or not we just need to adjust this to say that, you know, this is for the purpose of admission to the sandbox brackets, but not in any way setting the standard of competence that sandbox participants need to deliver to their customers. We need to have some sort of language that distinguishes what this is 
from what some of the concerns are about those standards, because I share those standards concerns. You know, of, of course, any participant needs to be held to an appropriate level of, of delivery of legal services, just like in any other regulated environment, be they lawyers or nuclear power station providers. But those standards need to be relevant to the risks. And, and here we're just trying to get to the risk. We want more services to tackle the risk of absence of services. So, yeah, we won't tolerate services that are more, th more than not likely to put somebody in a worse position. We will tolerate services that are more likely than not to put them in a better position. So I support this, but I'd be happy to have some sort of clarification to tackle the issue that this isn't setting standards. Bridget? I think that would be helpful uh, to add that language that Crispin is suggesting, just to make it really clear rather than in a footnote, just put it right up there that this is not meant, not a standard. Um, but I just want to remind everyone just from a procedural standpoint, again, this is hard because one, it's a, it's a different way of regulating than we're used to. So it's hard to understand. And then also we're trying to break it up into chunks. So I just want to remind everybody that this is really intended to be the principles from which we will assess risk. And that if, in our, again, like in the next segment, we're really gonna dive in and I'm hoping it will help some of these concerns that I'm here, that valid concerns that you're all raising. But what this is, this is not meant to be like, everyone is welcome and we're just gonna see what has happened. We, we have proposed, the SAGE subcommittee for the next memo talks much more specifically about once someone is an applicant, how are you going to assess the risk of that applicant? How are we going to, how are we gonna recommend that the regulator act in order to, cons to protect consumers? And there are a whole bunch of measures that are you know, being discussed in which that will happen. So it's not like this is, I just don't want, I don't want people to get tripped up on the fact that these regulatory principles are just opening things up without any kind of recommendations for consumers. They're just not in this particular part of the memo yet because we're just talking about the very big principles and then we'll move into the actual way that it happens. So I, I just want to flag that because I do think it's really important to remember. Uh, does anyone want to propose uh, a specific amendment? And I forget who the, the person was who made this motion, um, but if we want to have a, I have a comment too, I have my hand up. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I know, I, I just wanted to throw that out there, but I, I, I will get to you, uh, uh, Patricia. Patricia? Oh yeah, Someone, someone's mic is on. So I just wanna make this clear for the committee. As a committee member, I'm also a person who has a documented disability and I have some reading difficulties. Plus this, the, the, as, as has been stated, these topics are complex. And as a non-lawyer, I just wanna make sure that the public understands it as well. So if we do take the time to clarify, it does help me personally, but it helps others. So in the, in the sense that if I personally were to ask a member a question, I would expect that that level of um, understanding comes into play when I'm asking questions as a non-lawyer and a person who cannot read very quickly. Um, and I hope that uh, we can all applaud Governor Newsom for having published that book where he discloses his own disability of having dyslexia. Um, I don't have dyslexia, I have another affliction, but I just want to make it known that when I come onto these committee meetings, I come from a place of access to justice for, to include all persons and various income levels as well. Thank you. Did you sure? And did you did you have a question, Patricia, that that you wanted to raise about uh, number two? No, it, my question okay. was actually answered through the chat, okay. and I okay. appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, that, so, and I, I see that there are some hands, um, so, and I'm just asking this out out of the order of calling on you. I will call on you, but is there specific language that someone would like to propose to, as an amendment to number two? Um, reflecting the discussion that we just had. Mary, I'm quite happy to try and come up with some, but on, only if it's useful to the people that have raised the point. So I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to go and sit and scribble something if if it doesn't, if, if what I'm saying doesn't satisfy 
the debate discussion that we're having. Um, so, okay, on, and that's a good point, uh, Crispin. So we've, we've had um, concerns raised by Wendy, uh, Micah, um, Marta, Tom, um, I may, I don't, and I don't mean to miss anybody. This is just me doing my best to, to reflect my scribbled notes. Um, any of those people like to uh, address, you know, whether or not uh, an amendment to number two would um, help uh, alleviate some of the concerns that they had? Because if not, we'll just, we can just take it to a vote and see what happens. I think it would, if I, if I may, mm -hmm. I can raise my Let's hand. See. It would depend on what the, the amendment language was. For me, if the amended language indicated, I have a fundamental problem with the concept of a risk of harm to consumers being measured as if the consumer had no assistance or help at all. That concept is something that I personally can't vote for because I think what it, it, it results in is no um, protection for the consumer. So while I certainly would welcome an amendment to that language that clarified uh, what that meant, um, for me personally, just for transparency, that's where I'm coming from. Um, I think it would harm consumers. And, and I don't think that concept should be at any point of the sandbox. And I, I don't think that that reflects uh, reality uh, as it's been explained to me um, concerning consumers. Uh, consumer protection is not where there's no uh, standard whatever. So for me, in the asking whether uh, providing an amendment, which I, I do appreciate, um, would clarify it for me, only in so far as the concept of a standard um, that actually had a benchmark that's recognized um, under the law, which had added some consumer protection would clarify it for me. Okay, thanks. Uh, Toby? I was gonna talk on a slightly different point. So if you wanna go through this amendment issue, uh, why don't you finish that first? Um, uh, Dan? subject to what actually the amendment would say, it may be helpful in terms of um, bridging um, at least a potential gap on clarity that exists. Uh, I'm not sure that we're going to lose anything by doing so, and we may advance. Um, Tom? Yeah, speaking to uh, Crispin's useful legislative point, I, I I'm not sure finessing this helps because I the the problem from my perspective is this number two says and then it just it says basically we're going to do this in terms of entry and now we're saying that this 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 sandbox participant is now in but then once they're in we we're going to determine that they have to provide a competent service I think you want to do that at the at the first step, which is the entry step. So for me, an amendment would be something like for the purpose of admission to the sandbox, uh, consumers, the services provided shall be demonstrably competent. I mean, I, if you get in, you gotta be, you must have shown the sandbox regulator that you, you are gonna provide a service that's actually a useful service. I mean, so, okay. yep. All right. Thank you. And, and, and to your point, Tom, uh, John, I just saw a flash up in the chat, which I don't actually have open. So please, no one yell at me for not doing mm -hmm. this right. Uh, but it just popped up saying, in addition, the applicant must demonstrate the capacity to provide competent legal services, legal service. So that I think that suggested amendment, Tom, would be in place of yours. Mm -hmm. um, with that, and, and um, who was our mover here? Was it um, Dan or Eric? Um, the person who moved it was Eric and uh, Toby seconded it. Okay. So uh, I will, um, so, so, oh, I have to move the chat, sorry. Hang on. Um, so these would be, so let me ask the um, Eric, would either of these amendments be, satisfactory to you? 
Hey, Toby, you want to weigh in here? I, to me, these don't really change the, particularly the bottom one doesn't really change the substance of it. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Th thank you for enlarging it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you squinting. <laughs> I, I think they say the same thing. So, uh, Tom, unless you object, I, you know, I, I like John's phrasing. It seems a little broader, but um. yeah. I mean, I, 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 I personally could live with this. Actually, it, 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 I think, helps us focus the interest of this whole process on the folks that don't get services today or can't get services today. So, yeah, the combo works for me. So just just to say to make sure everybody's in agreement on this because I think this is fine. What we're really saying is, you know, because I, I think Judge Chang has made this point a lot that we're doing a two-step evaluation, you know, here. One is, you know, are, are you receiving any legal services? And number two is, are you receiving a competent legal service that doesn't make your situation sort of worse? Um, and, and I think if that's clarified, that I'm fine with that. So let me just make sure I understand. So are we saying that the the re revision? would be the, the John's revision in addition? Yeah, so just, I guess it would just end with, uh, so it would say for the purposes of admission to the sandbox, the risk of harm to consumers should be measured relative to the experience the consumers would have had absent the legal services provided. In addition, the applicant must demonstrate the capacity to provide competent legal services. Okay. I'd like to jump in to point out that we need to break here in a moment to move to the, um, speaker, we could have staff confirm that the speaker is available um, and people might appreciate a 60 second uh, transition period. So <clears throat> why don't we take a pause here and come back with a formal uh, proposed amendment um, and uh, move to final comments and a vote after the presentations. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll keep track of who's got their hand raised too. So let's reconvene in uh, 60 seconds with our guest speaker. Thank you. Meanwhile, someone from staff can tell me who's going to introduce uh, Professor Butler. I will. I thought maybe. Good. <laughs> nice. So uh, are we ready to start? Well, let me just start by uh, asking everyone who's able to, to turn your screens back on uh, and by thanking Professor Butler for being with us. Um, Bridget, go ahead and make the introduction, please. Sure. I'll just briefly. So State Professor Stately, Stacey Butler is here with us. She is uh, working with the Innovation for Justice program at the University of Arizona uh, School of Law and also recently the University of Utah School of Business. And through this um, really unique program that she has, she teaches students how to use design thinking and different ways to address policy issues and has developed a series of different proposals over the last few years, um, but one of them has turned into 
something that was a, um, approved to be operating in the Utah sandbox through Holy Cross Ministries having to do with medical debt collectors. So we invited Stacy to come here today to give us some more of a concrete example of what are the types of products that can arise out of the sandbox and her experience with that. So thank you very much. And we'll hear from you now. Great, thanks. I, um, you guys are over here, but my slides over here. So I'm gonna seem <laughs> like I'm looking more at you uh, shortly. Um, so let me see if this works. Are you all seeing my slide deck? We do. Right. Okay, so um, I will think this should take me about 20 minutes to share um, the things that Bridget asked me to cover today. And then hopefully we have time for questions if you all have any. Um, so um, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Innovation for Justice, we are a legal innovation lab and we're operating out of both the University of Arizona and the University of Utah. Um, we are a fully virtual social justice innovation lab that designs, builds, and tests disruptive solutions to the justice gap. And um, I think probably all of you are painfully familiar with the justice gap, but um, really the motivating statistics behind the lab are the fact that 71% of our low income population will experience a civil legal need this year. And that most of those people will say their lives are severely affected by that civil legal problem. Um, historically, the way we tackle these problems is through um, federally funded civil, aid, civil legal aid and pro bono work, but legal aid is unable to serve about 72% of the people that need and qualify for its services, and it would take 275 pro bono hours from every lawyer in the country to provide just one hour of legal services. Um, so the status quo right now um, with the current regulatory structure for our legal profession is that 86% of the low income population just isn't receiving any civil legal services. Um, what we're really interested though at I4J is this, um, that's you know the justice gap, but we're really interested in the justice awareness gap. So the fact that um, while one in three households is going to experience a legal problem this year, only 9% of them are aware that the problem is legal. Uh, most people experience those problems as human problems and engage in other sorts of problem solving. We've done a pretty good job of driving legal innovation way up here to people that um, come to us or to our courts to say, hey, I have a legal problem and I need help. Um, I4J is really interested in um, getting below the surface and um, working with people who are in that justice awareness gap. So students in the lab learn to work collaboratively across disciplines. We've had 12 different disciplines in the lab to date. We've operated since 2018. Um, all of our projects are community engaged. So we work with and within community from the outset of a project uh, all the way to project completion. And we're trying to engage in creative problem solving, trying things that haven't been tried before in the world of access to justice. Um, it's a combination of design and systems thinking. So I'll talk to you today about what that means. Um, we are a virtual lab, so we use a lot of technology, um, but we're really interested in how technology can be applied effectively um, for civil justice solutions and then um, making sure that all of our work involves evaluation, evidence-based evaluation, and the ability to change um, our course if it's not working. So we have three focus areas. I'm gonna to talk to you today really about this one, um, how we're leveraging regulatory reform to legally empower underserved populations. Um, but we also do some work in the space of ensuring that justice sector technology works for low-income populations. Um, and we have um, several projects that are using technology to empower policy level advocacy. So this is the team at I4J. I just wanted uh, to give this, um, this group a shout out. They're all working incredibly hard behind the scenes to keep I4J running. Um, okay, so I was asked to talk to you today about what we're doing in Utah and why we're in the sandbox. Um, and I'm assuming that you all sort of already know the Utah sandbox and how it operates. Um, so when we started thinking about a sandbox project, we were really interested in this opportunity to um, see how adapting unauthorized practice of law restrictions could create um, expanded opportunities for legal advice, um, particularly where there might be opportunities to reach people in the justice awareness gap and help people who have unrecognized civil justice issues um, through the use of non-lawyer advisors. I actually really hate the phrase non-lawyer, but the only other word I have is um, people with specialized legal training, but not a JD, and that's kind of a mouthful. So um, bear with me as I use the phrase non-lawyer repeatedly in this presentation. Um, but you know, a project like this makes Utah one of the first states to create this sort of opportunity space for nonprofits who could be providing legal services directly to those they serve. 
Um, we were also interested in getting into the Utah Sandbox because we already have a rag reform project live in the field in Arizona. So in partnership with Arizona Supreme Court, Arizona being the other rag reform state, um, we are currently training advocates who have specialized legal training, but not a JD, to provide uh, limited scope legal advice to survivors at a deep shelter. And this is the first pilot in the country that's allowing non-lawyers to give legal advice directly within the nonprofit sector. So um, our interest is how social services could be the key to upstream A2J interventions. And what we see when we look at the current landscape of rate reform is that there's some pretty big butts. Um, so one of the barriers to entry is that um, those of us who are talking about rate reform are we're pretty much all judges and lawyers. So um, we're really not including outside voices, I think, as much as we could in our discussions about how low-income Americans experience and navigate civil justice problem solving. Um, we're also um, creating these rate reform spaces with an eye toward market-driven innovation, which makes sense. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're building these spaces in a way that's going to work for the nonprofit sector. Um, and so what we've seen, I think, in early stage reg reform is what we call the nibble around the edges. It's not necessarily a problem, but the innovation that's coming into um, the sandbox in Utah and um, the alternative business structures in Arizona um, is largely people who already knew how to do legal practice and are taking advantage of kind of tweaking um, how they do those services. So um, our hope at I4J is that we're bringing the A2J to rape reform. Um, so last fall, we started a project focused on how we could use the Utah Sandbox opportunities to legally empower people experiencing medical debt. And we picked the topic of medical debt for several reasons. One is I'm sure you're all aware, debt collection is the most common type of civil case in the US. Um, and in Utah, 60% of their civil cases are debt collection and medical debt is their largest type of debt in collection. Um, medical debt is a leading cause of foreclosure and bankruptcy. Um, more than half of the bankruptcy debtors in Utah have medical debt. And there's also a pretty significant racial inequality problem when it comes to debt collection. Um, debt collection judgments are double in communities of color compared to mostly white communities. Um, we also saw that focusing on medical debt in the rape reform space would potentially offer a real opportunity or capacity for change. Um, so we pulled court data and we analyzed what's happening in medical debt cases when attorneys get involved. And what we saw was that when defendants have counsel, the uh, amount of debt collection judgment decreases by 50%, the likelihood of a wage garnishment decreases by 69%, um, and the dismissal rate um, goes way up from 19 to 53%. So when we look at this data, we see, okay, if we could get community-based advocates doing the same sorts of things that attorneys do, pulling the same sorts of levers that attorneys pull, there really is a capacity here to help problem solve debt collection in a meaningful way. Um, this is our design thinking framework that we use on all I4J projects, and we layer onto that the systems thinking. So um, design thinking, we start everything with uh, an empathetic lens. So we want to listen to the people experiencing the problem, but also cast a wide net and talk to all the stakeholders in the space. Um, we take time to unpack what we learn from working in the community. We think creatively around problem solving, and then we prototype and test ideas before investing resources in them, really trying to target where can we get the biggest bang for our buck if we're going to invest in a new um, solution or pilot. So at the empathy stage, um, we have everyone on the research team stand in the shoes of the person experiencing a debt collection. They navigate debt collection in Utah from the perspective of a defendant. Um, we watch debt collection court proceedings. We looked at, we did a landscape review, looked at all of the existing research and literature available. Um, and then we do a lot of interviewing in the community. Um, so for this project, we talked to 18 people who had experienced medical debt collection in Utah, 30 individuals and organizations from the nonprofit sector, 14 subject matter experts on the topic of debt collection who were from the legal profession, um, six healthcare providers, including the two major um, hospital healthcare providers in Utah, both of whom are nonprofits. Um, and then we had uh, six subject matter experts from the health law space advising on this project. So um, once we get all of that information back into the lab, we take the time to aggregate it. And we're looking at what's happening in the system. Where are the forces at play? Because what we wanna find are the bright spots. Like where is there really gonna be capacity for change um, in, within the status quo? Um, and some of the things we learned, particularly from talking to people who are experiencing medical debt collection in Utah, um, is that they are, by the time that medical debt goes to court, it's an old debt, and they are experiencing a number of other life, stre life stressors. So they have very, very low cognitive capacity for problem solving by the time debt goes to court. 
um, people experiencing medical debt really do want help. It was actually one of the top legal needs identified in a justice gap survey that Utah uh, Community Foundation conducted, but it was also one of the areas that legal services were providing the least assistance for. Um, so what we saw was people looking for resources, but not able to find them um, or just not looking at all. Um, and generally when they do look for help, they're not thinking to go to attorneys or the legal system. This is consistent, I think, with pre uh, previous research on the justice awareness gap. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, the, the research bore out in our community interviews in terms of the devastating downstream consequences that people reported um, that they were experiencing after um, incurring medical debt. We also talked to stakeholders in Utah and um, the nonprofit sector generally said, we encounter people with medical debt all the time. We don't know how to help them. And we don't know where to send them. Um, attorneys felt like there really are some teeth to the laws of medical debt and that there are potential viable defenses defendants could be asserting. So again, that capacity for change is there, um, but that the system is too complicated to navigate as a self-represented litigant. Um, creditors and creditors' attorneys um, were really willing to engage in change making, which is very encouraging to hear in work like this. Um, but they felt like they don't have um, a communication channel with the debtors they're trying to reach. Um, and so there's, there's not enough opportunity for out of court resolution. And then the judges that we talked to said, um, and this again is this idea of like, if you wait till the debt goes to court, it's too late. Judges feel like the system is too rapid and rigid for them to do anything. If that's even assuming defendants show up, which um, the default rate was I think in the 60s or 70% at the time of this project. Um, so very little that courts or judges felt like they could do to drive change. So then we created um, a whole lot of ideas about what we might wanna do in the sandbox related to medical debt. And we ended up picking three projects that we wanted to move forward. And the first is this idea of creating a uh, court diversion program. So um, in Utah, you get a 10 day notice before the complaint is filed in debt collection. So there's this little 10 day window where you know that the lawsuit is coming, but it hasn't hit yet. And there's a, a, like a last chance opportunity to problem solve. Um, and so the idea here is that um, advocates at a debt counseling nonprofit who are, um, have specialized training, but not a JD, would um, be sandbox approved to give legal advice to defendants who would learn about their services at the time they received the 10 day notice. Uh, we have a group of creditors willing to participate in this pilot as cooperative creditors engaged in problem solving outside of court. Um, the second pilot is to train bilingual community healthcare workers at Holy Cross Ministries to augment their services with limited scope legal advice about medical debt. So this is way upstream. These community health workers are out on their trusted advisors in their community. They're working with people on getting them qualified for Medicaid, making sure they're doing preventative health care. They are also most likely to intercept um, that first medical debt bill. So um, embedding the advice way upstream through community health workers. And then our third idea was um, to work with the University of Utah to train their bachelors of social work students to um, graduate with this credential that would allow them to give limited scope medical debt legal advice, um, these students tend to be the frontline staff at a lot of social services. And so the idea was if they can get the training as part of their social work education, um, then they can, we can diffuse it into the community at a lot of different nonprofits. Um, I was particularly interested in this idea because our legal innovation community has done a lot of speculation about whether social workers should be um, juiced with the ability to get legal advice. So um, once we identified those three possible projects, we took them back out to the community and prototyped and tested them. Um, a prototype is just a lo-fi version of an idea. It's presented visually and interactively so that we can collect feedback from the community and revise the idea based on what the community thinks of it. So um, it, we're a virtual lab. So the way that we prototype right now is to create simulations. So this is a tool called Scenes. We basically created these storyboards and asked people in the community to walk through the experience of working with what we call an MDLA, a medical debt legal advocate. Um, and we ran these storyboards in front of people experiencing medical debt, community healthcare workers, debt counselors, um, attorneys for both creditors and defendants, and just collected a lot of feedback about what the world might look like if we had non-lawyers out in the community giving legal advice about medical debt. So some of the things we learned were that creditors were really open to the idea. They thought that they would be willing to work with non-lawyer advocates, particularly if it was before the case went to court. Um, we heard from people experiencing medical debt. They really loved the idea of working with people 
um, in their community. So um, generally, sorry to tell you, they think lawyers are scary. Um, it doesn't necessarily occur to them that they want to get help from a lawyer. Um, but if it was a community-based non-lawyer advocate who they knew was somehow certified and trained, um, they would really respond positively to that assistance. And then um, the, the debt counselors and the community health care workers that we talked to about their ability to give these services um, said, yes, we think we, can, we feel confident that we could do this work if we had the proper training. Um, but the nonprofits that are housing these pilots expressed some concerns pretty early that we've been working to address. One is that they felt overtaxed and under-resourced. The idea of developing a sandbox pilot and getting into the sandbox um, was pretty overwhelming. Um, also, all the nonprofits we talked to have been um, trained for a long time to not give legal advice. It's a big part of how they operate is as soon as that legal issue rears its head, they want to kick it over to legal aid or some other referral. Um, so there's a, a, a shift in thinking that has to happen um, when you talk to social services about providing legal advice directly. They're all worried about liability and um, they're, they're concerned about the data reporting requirements sandbox requires. This is actually, it's not the idea of collecting and reporting data because nonprofits do that all the time. Um, all of their grant funding typically requires data collection and reporting, um, but they're really, they have ways that they like to do that. And so the idea of having to modify their case management system or collect data and report it in new ways um, can feel pretty overwhelming. So here are how, this is how we're working with our nonprofit partners on these projects to try to alleviate those barriers. So um, in terms of the overtax under resource piece, we are assisting our partners with grant writing to fund the pilots. And because they don't feel trained or qualified to give legal advice, we've built a modular online bilingual MDA, MDLA curriculum. It's, that it's really designed to embed into the um, course and scope of their daily business operations. So they can do the training as part of their job, a few hours at a time in a way that makes sense for their work. Um, we're working with connecting them with liability insurance providers. We already have a provider um, who's insuring our Arizona pilot. And then um, currently still in the process of designing a manual to help them navigate those sandbox requirements um, in a way that feels less daunting. So here is a, a quick overview on why we're really glad we tested these ideas. Um, the medical debt conversion program tested well in the community and um, we were able to put together an application that was approved by the same box in May. Um, our community healthcare worker pilot also tested well and has, um, we have that project approved in the sandbox as of May. Um, but when we really dug into the social work idea, we uncovered a lot of administrative and bureaucratic hurdles um, that might make this project challenging. And so uh, we have not applied to the sandbox for this project and we're working on exploring um, some possible changes to um, how we might train social workers in Utah to give legal advice. And one of those changes may be that medical debt is actually not the best um, type of legal issue to come out of the gate with. So if you want to read more about this project, it was, an out, it was a year-long project that um, I just covered in about 10 minutes. Uh, so if you want the long version, here's the bit.ly link. And um, if you want to learn more about I4J, this is our website. And um, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer questions from there. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. And I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Um, I will call on people as I see raised hands. But since I don't see a raised hand yet, let me start us off with one. Um, <clears throat> how can we make our sandbox more attractive to nonprofits? So, I mean, I think it's some of those barriers that I mentioned. So um, thinking about, first of all, can you include nonprofits now as you're designing your sandbox and hear from them on um, what services they're providing in the community, what issues they're seeing in terms of um, the civil legal issues that their clients are experiencing? Um, and how do they already collect and report data? And is there a way for you to align with their current practices um, so that your ability to monitor what they're doing and have them report, um, if, you're, if you're looking at a risk-based uh, model like Utah, um, a way that gets you the information you need without adding layers of complication to how nonprofits operate. Uh, Eric has a question. We've been struggling a little bit with, um, well, essentially how to pay for the sandbox. And I guess one question for you is, um, you know, how big an, a barrier would fees to sort of applications be to the kind of work you're doing? Because um, one of the things that strikes me is, 
you know, you're providing a lot of assistance to nonprofits that are pretty stretched. And so um, if you wouldn't mind speculating, I'd love your thought. No one's ever asked me that question before. My immediate thought is we're already helping these nonprofits. I mean, like this is just a challenge with nonprofits getting in the sandbox in general is that it's not a market driven model. And so at least in the early stages, it's gonna have to be grant funded. Um, and so to me, a sandbox fee is just something that gets built into um, the, the grant funding applications that nonprofits are going to have to um, put into place to get these, these pilots stood up and launched. Sasha. Hi, Stacey, thank you for the presentation. It's exciting to hear about all the work you guys are doing. Um, I'm curious, in our work, we work with nonprofit partners and, and with caseworkers and social workers primarily. Um, it's hard to imagine, like you said, some of them being the key applicant. Are you guys partnering with them on the application? Um, like you were talking about them having the liability and standing up the systems and the data, but are there pieces of that that your group or other groups can take on or are you anticipating they'll be lead on some of that? So we're doing a lot of handholding all along the way. I mean, we, we drafted the sandbox applications for their review. Um, we are, you know, continuing to work with, we attend their sandbox meetings with them and, um, you know, the, the work on the manual, which is still a work in progress is, um, you know, troubleshooting, like what do they not understand and how do we make it more accessible? And, um, you know, same thing with being able to adapt data collection systems as needed, helping them understand um, what the, risk categorization means that they're assigned. We have one that's, one project is high risk and one is moderate risk. So um, each, each pilot has a slightly different reporting requirement. Um, so we're really just hoping to be helpful um, in terms of kind of demystifying uh, the sandbox. Um, but, you know, I also, everyone that we've worked with at the UTS sandbox is also really good at, at providing that sort of assistance. So I don't, I don't know that it wouldn't happen without us. I think that nonprofits could just work directly with um, with the Sandbox team and um, and figure it out. John. Hi, Stacy. Hey, um, I guess I'm gonna ask the question, what do the preliminary data show? Uh, what are you finding? And kind of related to that, a little bit related to that, do you see a scalability issue? I mean, one of the things we've been talking about a little bit today is just how much larger California is than Utah and sort of how that would unfold if uh, there were an opportunity to do this sort of thing in, in California. So it's really early days for the research part of this. The, um, the Arizona pilot that's training advocates at a DV shelter, um, those advocates have been operating in the field since March of this year. So, um, and we're running that as a randomized control trial. Um, we've had about 100 participants so far that have received um, licensed legal advocate services. So I don't have um, I don't have results yet. Um, I can tell you, like qualitatively, in terms of the feedback we're getting from the nonprofit partner and their clients, it seems like it's going really well. Um, we haven't had any complaints about services or quality of services or um, you know consumer risk. Um, and then our Utah pilots are approved by the Sandbox, but not operational yet because we're still in the process of securing funding for those. Neil. Uh, I don't know if you know this yet, but do you know exactly what the Utah regulator is going to have you report data wise? I don't, I, I could probably tell you if I went back and looked okay. through um, the, the application in the back and forth that we've had with them, but um, no, not off the top of my head. Okay. Neil, I, it's actually, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's one, it's in the materials for today, one of them, the Holy Cross uh, Ministries order. Oh. Okay. It's, it's, it, it's a long document, but that what they have to provide is actually in that order. Great, thanks. So I have a question um, about the concern you expressed that the nonprofits had around liability. And I think you said you had an insurer lined up prepared to offer liability insurance. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and about uh, whether the... Uh, ambiguity about what kind of liability would be imposed has been a, a problem with insur getting insurers into this new market? Like, for example, are these non-lawyer providers of legal assistance expected to be held to the same standard of care as lawyers providing uh, legal assistance? So our licensed legal advocates in Arizona operate under terms of an administrative order issued by the Arizona Supreme Court, and it does impose a professional standard of conduct. Um, I don't know if my, if our 
liability provider would, would like me to share their information, I can um, check with them and circle back. Um, from the nonprofit perspective, I think it's just, it's a service they've never offered. And they've heard from lawyers and well, mostly lawyers for years, not to give legal advice um, that, you know, that it's unauthorized practice. Well, I mean, there's been this terrible chilling effect of unauthorized practice of law restriction. So I think some of it is just um, communication about like the scope of service. And um, a lot of the curriculum is focused on rules of professional responsibility or you know, the ethical components of providing legal services because these providers already know a lot about how the system operates. Um, they've been helping people, you know, particularly on our DB pilot. These are advocates who are already able to give legal information, just not legal advice. So um, I, I think that a lot of it is just adding transparency to um, what you can and can't do and what your professional obligation is. Um, I, I have not, we have not heard concerns from our insurance provider in Arizona about um, the ability to do that well. Thank you. Crispin. Thanks, Chair. Uh, really interesting, Stacey. Just two, two questions for you. Um, we're fairly early still in our, our deliberations about whether we should do a sandbox, what it should look like, how broad, deep, wide, shallow. Um, if, if you could tell us to do one thing and stop us from doing one thing, what would they be? a really good question, Crispin. Um, I mean, you could you could absolve the liability concerns if you create it. I don't know how much of this would come from the judiciary versus the legislature, but if there was, you know, just like a Good Samaritan rule in place that people who are in the sandbox or nonprofits that are in the sandbox because they want to provide legal services free of charge to help the low income community um, are not are not going to experience liability. I think that would be, I mean, that's sort of, I don't know how pie in the sky that sounds to you, but um, I think that would take away a lot of that concern. Um, and I also think if you're still in the like inception phase that there's such an opportunity right now to talk, to get outside the legal profession and talk to communities about um, what is what is the community need and what do they what services do they want if, if we're going to recreate how legal services are delivered like where is the biggest bang for your buck john stacy can you help us at all on this question of uh, we're grappling right now with sort of this competence question about assuring these people who are not lawyers actually are going to do an okay job at what they're doing and maybe maybe share with us from the perspective of the consumers, you know, the people who are in need of that service, what would you say is their view of being comfortable that they're getting, you know, competent services? Yes, yeah, so I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is that the comparison is not, can these new types of advocates who are equipped to give limited scope legal advice, like can they do everything a lawyer can do because that's not the baseline. We're talking about services for a population whose status quo is nothing. They are navigating the system alone or not at all. So in how we've designed the randomized control trial for the licensed legal advocate pilot, we're comparing someone going through the system alone with someone going through the system with the assistance of a licensed legal advocate. Um, so I think that that's important to keep in mind is that <laughs> the, the, the competence guiding North Star is, can, will it be more helpful than trying to navigate a system designed for lawyers by yourself? Thank you for all of those answers to questions. I'm not seeing any more hands raised. So I think this is my opportunity to say thank you very much for telling me about the wonderful work you all are doing and for uh, sharing it with us so that we can better understand what it means for us as we go about trying to design a, a sandbox for California. Appreciate you being with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Stacey. Sure. See you later. 
I had advertised that we would go from one presentation to uh, a lunch break. I see we have about 12 minutes before the advertised uh, lunch break. So if we could uh, reconvene on the topic that we rather precipitously left, um, Mary, I'm going to throw it back to you uh, to see if you want to continue with discussion on, I think it was recommendation number two, which perhaps Mimi can put back up on the board. And we'll do that briefly before we do break for our lunch period uh, and come back at one. Okay, that sounds great. So uh, Mimi, if you could put up that revised um, resolution or recommendation, um, that was number two. And uh, as I understood it, we would take out that second um, provision. So there, there would only be one additional, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and the people who had their hand up, uh, Marta. Um, the addition doesn't help me because um, we're not, it, it one, the first sentence kind of makes me feel like if you can walk outside and talk to your neighbor and that neighbor can give you um, some uh, legal advice, then that's how we are kind of measuring what's happening to the consumer. But then in the second sentence, it's a completely different um, uh, concept in which the applicant must demonstrate capacity to provide competent legal services, which I'm fine with the second sentence, but paired with the first, which I've always had a problem with, even with the footnote, I, I, I'm not really understanding number two as presently presented. Um, Lucy and then Wendy. Thank you, Mary. Um, I think uh, number two, I think part of the problem with it is the framing, um, the first clause, you know, for the purposes of admission to the sandbox. Really, and this is sort of what Crispin touched on, but really number two should be considered a foundational principle of the sandbox regulation. It's a relativity principle. Um, and as Stacy just kind of put the pin on that, it's important because it focuses the regulatory decision-making on the reality of the vast majority of consumers that they do not have access to legal help at all. So when the regulator is assessing the potential risk inherent in a proposed applicant, or when the regulator is assessing the reported data, or when the regulator is deciding on an enforcement action, this relativity principle reminds the regulator to consider the issue at hand in the context of a world in which most people don't have any legal help, as opposed to a world in which everybody has a lawyer. So what does that mean, for example, when the regulator is looking at a proposal like Stacy's proposals in which non-lawyers are practicing law, the regulator doesn't consider the risk of that proposal as against full representation by lawyers, but rather as against the reality of no representation at all. So respectfully, I would suggest that perhaps what we need to do is change that first clause and reframe this as a regulatory principle and not a criterion for admission. And just one more thing to that end, I think I have to object to the inclusion of an admission criterion of competency as it is framed um, in the blue um, on number two. It's actually quite a significant change and potentially I think imposes a significant burden both on the regulator and on the applicant. So like, what does this mean? What does competency mean? And how is it to be measured? And how is that measurement actually going to be done by the regulator um, before admitting any entity to the sandbox? And particularly, you know, the word competency, as I was sort of saying before, is a term of art, particularly in the legal context. Um, and I don't know that it is the word that should be applied across the board here. In assessing the risk of any proposed entity, the regulator, according to number one, which we just voted to approve, does assess the risk that the proposed entity provides low quality services, services that are inaccurate or wrong, services that fail to identify a material legal or factual issue, and services that weren't needed. And that, I think, is the appropriate space for the regulator to focus on, particularly if the goal is to allow um, new providers and, and new types of services to be tested, um, as Stacy so you know um, eloquently sh and and um, visually showed us. You know, uh, we really setting up an upfront rule around competency. I think potentially has the 
capacity to completely close a lot of that down. So I, I would, I don't think I could vote for this with that additional language in there. Okay, uh, Wendy. I think I have the opposite problem um, is that uh, I think the words that Lucy just used of the relativity principle, I appreciated her using that phrase because I think it aptly illustrates the problem that we have here, relative to what? And Marta indicating getting advice from your neighbor, is that really the standard we're utilizing here that is not utilized in any other context? It certainly would not be uh, a standard that uh, supports consumers and is not used in any other regulatory environment. I would propose, given that we obviously have, uh, this seems to be more of a, um, <laughs> a, a, a an outlook on life kind of issue. So I'm wondering if we could, for two, break this up into two, have an A as it exists currently, and have a B which specifies that the standard of care to be utilized for sandbox participants has not yet been determined and is not specified as 2A and then vote separately on it. Does that make sense? Um, yep. So, because yeah, so you're, it, it, that's a good point. So you're taking out, um, you're suggesting getting rid of the proposed uh, revision here right now. No, no, no. Oh, so what are, I'm okay. saying is if you take a two, mm -hmm. put an A with the addition of the language regarding competent legal service, although I'm a stickler for definitions because I've worked on legislation, I like to know what I'm voting for. Otherwise, it feels like a pig in the poke to me. But in any event, put 2A for what's already written. And then for 2B, have a statement indicating that the standard of care as it relates to liability purposes has not yet been determined and is not what is set forth on 2A. I'm sure we can wordsmith this better, but what I'm trying to get at is what I've heard is, we're gonna decide this down the road, what we think the standard of care to, should be I know many um, on this call, many members have very different beliefs about deregulation in this area and what's best for consumers. I obviously think there should be a standard of care that already exists under the law for which we know what it is and can regulate to, and that the judiciary has experience in determining. I also frankly think there's a positive uh, consequence that there may be an insurance market that could then say, okay, there's a standard of care here. Um, and so I'm gonna, as an insurer, feel more comfortable um, in that market. But in any event, uh, I think it has uh, positive consequences in two different areas. But given that what's being stated is we're not determining the standard of care, if that's true, then let's state that explicitly. Um, and then let's vote on 2A and 2B separately. Um, okay, that's a, that's a good suggestion. But um, I guess one question I would have is why not just have, why not just add your new language about the standard of care to number two so it's all considered as a whole? Because if we vote on it separately, um, we might end up with like a 2B that just on its own, which doesn't really make sense if we don't have a 2A. And a list of another thousand things that we haven't yet determined either. We'd have to vote. That, well, if I may, if I, since it's my suggestion, um, because we're talking about the standard of care here about uh, in one aspect. And so this isn't about the 5,000 other things we haven't determined. It's about a very particular topic. And so there's obviously a split in the members um, as to what they believe should be the appropriate standard of care. Um, I think that's been demonstrated by the comments. And so it seems to me that it would be appropriate. I would imagine that you may get unanimity on 2B. I don't imagine you'll find that with 2A. I think it would more accurately indicate um, where the, the members are. I, I Yeah, I understand that. And I think it's a, it's a good suggestion. I just, to me, I don't see what the, 
um, if if we're if we're if the members are not behind to your two A, um, then I don't see with a function of two B on its own if we vote down two A. That's my only that's my only point um, about including them together as, as one. Um, uh, hang on, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, so the let me go back to the uh, well. First, let me hear from um, Toby and then Neil. You're mute. Sorry. One of the concerns that I have with defining competence up front is if I'm going to come into the sandbox and I've got this innovative idea, it hasn't been done before. It's new. Um, how do I prove up front that this is going that, that the services I'm going to provide are going to be competent if it's not even clear? just what those services are until we've worked through the process in the, in the sandbox of the admissions and all. And, and we define what it is I'm doing and I can say, I will do it competently. Of course I'll do it competently, but I'm not sure how one goes about proving that for a, an untested uh, hypothesis. Um, the other comment that I wanted to make is that, you know, there was the discussion of are we creating a two-tier system of justice. And I think the reality is we have a multi-tiered system of justice right now. We certainly have two, lawyers and nothing, is already a two-tier system. This is adding a third, but I think we have, you know, high-priced lawyers, uh, brand new lawyers just out of law school. We have a range of options uh, creating a, a multiple-tier uh, system of justice. Uh, and so I think the complaint that this is going to create a two-tier system is is really inappropriate. Neil? I was just gonna say that, um, you know, there is a definition of competency that's under uh, rule 1.1, 1 .1, uh, the rules of professional conduct. So I, I don't know if, if that language is being added with that definition in mind. And then second, um, I, don't, I don't know if standard of care is the same as competency necessarily, if we're talking about the meaning of competency within rule 1.1. 1 .1. So just some points to that I'm flagging. Yeah, and that's a good point. And it would not be the same um, because standard of care is a you know civil liability standard that's I mean, California is determined by the common law, and the competency standard in Rule 1.1 is a disciplinary standard. And in fact, the the Rule 1.0 makes clear that the, the that the concepts in the rules of professional conduct don't define civil liability. So that's, right. that's we haven't discussed this in any depth, and it's a good point to make, um, Tom. Sorry, another rookie mistake. My apologies. I think that we're with the two blue pieces of language. You're talking about sort of different time frames fundamentally. So I think they all do fit. So the the first blue deals with a demonstration of capacity to provide a competent service. And I agree with Neil that I was thinking, at least in my own mind, that it's rule 1.1. So for example, if you're going to do as we've just heard, we're going to create a service to deal with medical debt you'd have to make at least some demonstration that this is how we're going to do it. This is what we're going to do. Um, so even if it has not been done before, there certainly could be a demonstration as part of the application and entry process. And then I think Wendy's language goes to the post hoc or post entry uh, portion of the experience. Somebody's in the, in the sandbox, um, problems occur, what standards do we use to judge that? So that's a different thing. And she's suggesting that we defer what that standard might be until further in our conversation. So I, I think I could live with all of these candidly, but back to you. Uh, Marta? Yeah, I'll just be brief. I think Tom touched upon it. I think um, just to Toby's point in particular that I think you can demonstrate competency even with an innovative legal service uh, on the front end that maybe hasn't been done before because you're going to demonstrate with respect to your application whether or not there are safeguards and um, in place to protect the consumer that you're delivering the legal services to. So I think that that has to be part of um, a risk assessment in terms of the application process itself. And I think it can be done and I think it must be done um, for the applicant to demonstrate that they're gonna be doing something, they're gonna be offering a service uh, and they're gonna be doing it in a competent manner. So people don't get ripped off, experience fraud, theft, loss of privacy and abuse of trust, et cetera. I mean, I think it's, it's, 
it, it, it's got to be there. Um, Toby, is your hand up again? It is just one real quick thing. And that is, uh, if you look ahead to three and four, those are the, the provisions for what happens after you're in the sandbox. And those talk about uh, living, complying with the rules and laws for other licensees and the like. And that's where 1.1 comes in. So this three and four already say that if you're in the sandbox, you're subject to 1.1 and the definition of competence. Whereas beforehand, uh, you know, showing that you will be competent is fine. I don't have a problem with it. But uh, I think we already have something that in three and four defines that 1.1 is going to apply. Okay, thanks, Crispin. And I'd like to do something. Thanks. Um, I think it was me that started saying perhaps we should have an amendment. And I sort of regret it now, because I think the danger is with these amendments is that we're confusing two different things. For me, too, as originally dra drafted, is specifically not about setting a standard of the delivery of the legal services to the consumer. It's about measuring the relative risk between what's what's likely to happen in the sandbox and what happens when people don't get advice. And the standard of service is, as Tom says, dealt with elsewhere in one, three, and four. So when you do put it to a vote, I'd, I'd like at least one option to be for us to vote on the original wording. Okay, so the, thank you everybody. This is very helpful. And um, and I know, and Mark, I don't know if you have your hand still up. Um, John, I, you do, I think, um, but, but I'm gonna propose something. How about, we separate out two into three different subsections. So we could vote on 2A, which is the existing language. 2B would be the in addition competent services. And then three would be the standard of care point. My hand was also up. This is Micah. Micah, I appreciate that. And John, I see you have your hand up also. We are now five minutes past when I said we were going to break. So I'm gonna break us now for lunch. We're going to come back at one o'clock for a presentation. When the presentation is over and we revert to this, uh, John and Micah will have an opportunity to address the group. But I would also like to ask in the interim that the person who made the uh, original motion, uh, please tell us what, what you accept or don't accept as a friendly amendment. You've had several uh, suggestions, including most recently Mary's, that there be three different uh, proposals, but I, I'm going to turn it back to the motion maker to decide so we know what we're going to vote on and hopefully we'll be able to, uh, one way or another, finish with number two uh, shortly after the presentation. So thanks everybody. Sorry to cut things off prematurely, but I think that little increment of discussion did move the ball forward and I'll see you all in 24 minutes for our one o'clock presentation. Bye-bye. Thank you to the hardworking members of our committee for putting up with such a short lunch break. And thank you to Charlie Moore to coming to uh, speak with us. I'm going to turn the mic over to Lucy Rica to introduce our guest. Justice Tinker. Um, welcome to Charlie Moore. Charlie Moore is the founder and CEO of Rocket Lawyer Incorporated. His experience as an attorney representing startups exposed him to both the high cost and high value of great legal advice. So he started Rocket Lawyer to deliver such high value services at a price that most people can afford. And today Rocket Lawyer is one of the most widely used legal services in the world and has operations in both the United States and the United Kingdom. Charlie uh, is a lawyer, has been engaged in law and business since the beginning of his career, um, which started as an attorney with Venture Law Group in Menlo Park. California. He graduated from the United States Naval Academy and University of California at Berkeley for his JD. He served in the U.S. Navy, was an officer on the USNS Mercy, and is a Gulf War veteran. Charlie currently serves as the chairman of the board of directors of Rocket Lawyer and is also on the board, uh, executive board of Tech for America. So Charlie, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Lucy. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, since you mentioned my military service, I'd just feel bad if I didn't recognize uh, for a moment uh, General Powell, who, who just passed. And he was uh, a great inspiration. He was the 
chairman of the Joint Chiefs when I served. And um, it's a sad, sad passing. Um, with that, um, I'm happy to take the conversation uh, in, in any direction. Uh, although we did prepare um, this deck and appreciated your sending questions in advance, but I'm happy to take it, you know, in any direction that is helpful. Well, thank you for bringing the deck and I didn't see the questions, but I suspect they'll get you started in the right direction. We're very interested in the services that you would like to provide in California if we have a sandbox and the things you think are important to see in a sandbox, such as the one we're considering. What can't you do here that you'd like to do here? And uh, what do you do in other jurisdictions that you think would better serve California consumers if you were allowed to do it here? So off the cuff, that's some questions that probably overlaps to some extent with the questions you were sure. give, given in preparation, but we'll let you do your thing. And then if you're willing to uh, take questions from our group. Yeah, happy to, happy to. Um, so why don't we go to the next, uh, go to the opening slide. I think that the title um, of this working group, Closing the Justice Gap is um, really inspiring. Um, that's the mission that Rocket Lawyer uh, has as well. And, and something that I think has been uh, one of the happier parts of the journey um, in the more than a decade uh, since we started the company has been, um, I've yet to ever uh, sit down with a regulator anywhere in the world from the Paris Bar Association to the Law Society in the UK uh, to many, many, many states. I've, I've yet to ever sit down and um, within a few minutes, not come to the realization that our uh, goals are aligned, our mission is aligned. Um, I started the, the company uh, because of this, the, the UI, the user interface to justice is outdated. Justice being defined as the fair administration of law and authority. Um, I grew up in, in a small business uh, working with my dad in a chain of gas stations. Um, I spent most of my childhood, you know, working um, at gas stations back when people used to, like me, used to pump people's gas. Um, and it wasn't all self-service, although I spent a lot of my teenage years behind the bulletproof glass of a self-service gas station in North St. Louis, Missouri. And so I, I saw the legal system. I saw our business um, have its ups and downs. I saw my dad have, have, have his ups and downs. Um, in business, and I saw the massive difference that access to capable counsel makes um, in the lives of small business people, as well as the poor people, for the most part, who are our customers in a lot of the areas of the city where we operate. And so uh, fast forward, once I, you know, fell in love with technology, um, started coding uh, when I was a kid, my dad got me a Commodore 64. And fast forward to um, you know learning how to code, uh, going to college, law school, et cetera, and then um, falling in love with the internet and seeing great lawyers in action um, who made a lot of money. Uh, and at conferences, often I'll say I'm a recovering high price lawyer because um, you know when I was at Wilson Sonsini and Venture Law Group, um, the fees are high. The clients could afford those fees because they were uh, venture-backed companies for the most part. Um, I also represented folks like Goldman Sachs, et cetera. But for most people, people like my dad, people like the folks I grew up with, you know, they didn't have access to uh, those kind of uh, legal resources. And they needed a better UI, uh, I thought, uh, in order to get access to them. So, uh, our mission has never changed. We never pivoted, even when it was hard. And that is to make law affordable enough for everybody. That's been the Rocket Lawyer mission since the day that started in, in my home office um, over a decade ago. And so, uh, as it says, uh, the legal system has sort of fallen behind the digital innovation curve by a lot. Um, it doesn't meet the expectations and needs of consumers. It doesn't work as well as TikTok um, for, for you know, regular people. And uh, we set out to change that and give folks a better UI into uh, 
justice into legal help. Um, along the way, we've learned, and I think uh, Richard Susskind, uh, the professor in the UK would agree that he's right. Um, there's this massive latent demand for legal services. So uh, today about one in nine American adults, more than 30 million people have a Rocket Lawyer account. Uh, most folks that use Rocket Lawyer have never hired a lawyer before. So like uh, if you'd work backward Southwest Airlines um, in the beginning in the 70s and 80s, a lot of the folks that flew Southwest had never flown on a plane before because they didn't have an affordable way to do it. And so what we know is we've brought a lot of people and businesses into the legal system, into the legal system that otherwise they would have been operating sole proprietorships. They would have been not having um, access to limited liability protection that Abraham Lincoln was a champion of, uh, that they would not have put things in writing, um, have contracts if they didn't have, you know, the, the, the type of UI that we started to provide. And so there's still a, a really long way to go. And one of the other things that I'm quite proud of, if you go to the next slide, is in addition to, you know, these millions of people here and, and elsewhere, um, we're not just in the UK, we're in France, we're in Spain, we're in the Netherlands and, and other countries as well. Um, but it's usually the same kind of folks like Greg Lutz, who owns the Third Cousin restaurant here uh, in Potrero in San Francisco, who incorporated a food truck business initially in Rocket Lawyer in 2014 and has now grown, he realized his dream of owning his own restaurant. Those are the kind of people that uh, use Rocket Lawyer. And again, uh, Greg probably wouldn't have ever incorporated um, had Rocket Lawyer uh, and, and other companies like us like ours not existed. Now, the other thing that's true is uh, lawyers have done really well um, on, on the platform. Um, and so if you maybe go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, so it, it's been a partnership uh, everywhere that we've operated. Um, I, I'd say there are a few things I'm proud of on this slide. Um, first and foremost, we've, taken sort of a long view um, toward closing the justice gap. Um, we've actively experimented with the American Bar Association. Like I said, I've never met any um, regulator yet who ultimately doesn't realize that we share the same objective, which is to get more people um, affordable access to lawyers and uh, the modern tools of justice as we call them. And so we've worked with, I'm on the board of Pro Bono Net right now. Um, we, we hope to provide them with technology as well to help with uh, Pro Bono. Um, One Justice we support, we've supported multiple legal aid, uh, local legal aid organizations. And, um, and, and I'm also really proud of the fact that, you know, uh, there's lots of competition uh, and, and we welcome competition. In fact, I think one of the best things that you can do as an innovator is to sort of show the way and then others are going to naturally uh, compete and, uh, and that's healthy for society. So there are 72,000 law firms. Uh, there are over 200 legal tech companies in California alone. And that wasn't the case, uh, you know, more than a decade ago when we started in terms of how much, uh, how many other legal tech companies uh, are out there now. And so uh, those are all uh, really good things. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll give you a, a sense of uh, what we think Californians want. Um, Californians, you've got the surveys, you've got the, the data. Uh, you know, 55% uh, of Californians at, at all income levels experience at least one civil legal problem in their household, yet 70% of them receive no legal assistance in the current way the world works. Um, like I said, most of the folks who use Rocket Lawyer have never hired a lawyer before. And most of them will tell you if, if they didn't have the solution, they probably wouldn't. And so uh, on the platform, they are actually hiring lawyers. 
um, where they otherwise uh, would not have been able to. So they're not do-it-yourselfers. They're they're getting licensed attorney help um, uh, at a price they can afford in a in a user interface that's familiar to them and like the other things that they do, you know, on their phones, and um, which is the primary computing device for most people. Um, you know, uh, we also know that 27% uh, of low-income Californians. Uh, received some legal help while 34% of middle income people did. Again, access, as we all know, but just repeating it, goes up as your income level um, rises. So um, we think that to provide Californians this help, it's going to take, like I said on the prior slide, it's going to take this sort of partnership between public, private, private competition. Um, all of those are, are, are different tiers of the solution. And, um, and we certainly hope that we can help um, with, with each tier, with folks who have no ability to pay by providing um, tools to organizations like Pro Bono Net, Net Legal Aid and others, um, and then affordability of the people who, who can't afford to pay. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is not new at this point. Um, we've been operating in the UK, uh, initially under a regulatory sandbox um, where we were able to employ solicitors directly. That was the main uh, uh, sandbox authority. Um, and we started doing that, you know, more than five or six years ago. Um, at the time, there were some uh, concerns, not, uh, negative concerns, none of which uh, to date have come to fruition. In fact, the lawyers who were uh, part of the Rocket Lawyer Network uh, before we hired solicitors um, are thriving. Um, we've added more independent attorneys since, uh, and the overall model um, works great, as this illustrates, works great for the consumer who can use our apps, use our UI for really simple needs. For the most part, stop operating outside the legal system, come into the legal system, and what that demand actually creates is, is more cases and controversies for attorneys to handle, uh, not less, um, because again, more people have been brought into the legal system as a result of this. So um, we've, we've seen, and I doubt there's anybody uh, uh, in the UK who would say that this has been anything but a positive development. Um, and similarly, it's uh, a year now in Utah, um, and the same model is, has been operating in Utah for over a year. We've helped over a thousand customers, and we talk about people as customers. Um, customer comes first. Um, people want to interact with the legal system this way. That's crystal clear. Um, tens and upon tens of millions around the world are doing so. Um, already. Um, we've helped over a thousand customers in Utah alone um, in the last year uh, as part of this experiment. And it's gone, um, I think, beautifully. Uh, and we've had more than 200 attorney engagements generated as part of the Utah sandbox already. Um, and I think that's going to scale uh, by an order of magnitude now at, since we've had the first year under our belt. Um, so uh, back to California, uh, California has always been an innovative uh, state. California is where Silicon Valley is based. California consumers expect uh, California to be a place of innovation. Uh, this type of innovation, uh, but California is not the first, um, not even close to being the first. Um, and so, uh, at best, California is a sort of medium paced follower in terms of uh, 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 providing this kind of modern interface to uh, justice for people. And that has its benefits because uh, at this point, um, it's uh, crystal clear um, that uh, customers like uh, services like this. Um, they're really effectively zero negative uh, impacts in the jurisdictions where this has been legal for quite some time.
And is that a sign that you're finished with the presentation that you brought and ready for questions? Absolutely. Okay, super. Let me change my view so that I can see as hands go up. Jim Sandman has his hand up already. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Jim. Can you explain to us why you can't do in California today what you would like to do and what kind of re-regulation would be necessary to allow you to do what you want to do? Sure, I'll take a stab at it, um, but not my uh, area of expertise. So I'll be the first to admit. Um, uh, it's essentially the firm ownership, you know, the ownership rules uh, around um, non-attorney ownership of uh, legal service or, or law firms or legal service providers, number one. And number two, um, sharing fees, which is part, part and parcel to the same thing. So um, uh, I'll stop there. I have, I have more notes, but. Can you describe your ownership structure? Sure, we're a, we're a um, corporation. Uh, we're a Delaware corporation that operates uh, in California um, as our uh, headquarters. And we're, uh, we have shareholders uh, uh, like most uh, uh, C corporations. We have shareholders, we have uh, mostly common stock. We also have preferred stock. Are you publicly traded? No, private. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Charlie, for coming and, and talking to us. Um, one question that I have is, um, as you described, uh, certainly your experience in the UK and then also in Utah, as you said, you know this this model works. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, you know, we're in the process of trying to figure out how we might set up a sandbox, what admission criteria we'd have, what data we would collect. When you say the system works based on your experience in Utah and the UK, um, I'm assuming that's based on data. And if you could describe what the data is that, that you're basing that statement on. Well, um, really specifically uh, to Utah, um, uh, we just uh, did a one year sort of uh, look with the Supreme Court there and, and other interested folks. Um, We've had uh, zero complaints. Um, we've, we've helped, as I mentioned, over a thousand um, customers already, and it's growing and, and scaling. And um, it it actually works uh, better in 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 a lot of situations than the more sort of clunky. I mean, let's face it: what we actually have now is just sort of a clunky system um, when we can. Uh, uh, eliminate some of the sort of uh, artificial hurdles to delivering great customer service, um, people respond to it. And so I think um, what the Utah Sandbox has enabled us to do and what the UK has enabled us to do is actually deliver even better service that customers love even more. And uh, that's- So do you do like a customer satisfaction survey at the end? I mean, it's- do. Uh, Okay. You do, yeah. And we do that uh, across the board um, with, with everybody who, who uh, interacts with an attorney. Thank you, John. Hi, Charlie. Thanks for coming in and talking to us. Um, so if I, if I understand the basic distinction between what you're allowed to do in Utah and what you currently can do in California is that in Utah, you have not employees who are lawyers who are directly providing services to the clients slash customers that Rocket Lawyer has in play. Whereas in other places, that kind of is a referral out to that lawyer. The separate relationship happens between the, the customer and the lawyer, right? Correct. Okay. And, so, and in fact, John, if I could just, we, we still do both actually. And that's what the slide that I put up illustrates. Um, it's it's really being able to deliver the service that the customer needs. Right, but the, the innovation piece is that you have a firm that is owned by people other than lawyers, uh, Rocket Lawyer, employing these lawyers who are providing the services to clients. And 
I guess I, one thing we've heard uh, in the public comments in these meetings a lot is a concern that corporations, if they're allowed to be controlling the provision of legal services, are, are going to be detrimental to the customers. They're going to somehow or another be you know, not as concerned with the, with the rights and interests of the, of the customer and the client as, as may, maybe a lawyer or a law firm would be. And I just wanted you to address that, you know, because I think that's a very significant concern that a lot of the people on the committee have is that if you leave, if you somehow have control of the entity providing legal services, not with lawyers, that it's going to be potentially, it's going to be detrimental to the, to the clients. I, thanks, John. I, I haven't seen any actual evidence to support that theory in, in all the years. Um, lawyers uh, abuse their relationship with clients um, uh, in some instances. And I suppose that in some instances, some bad actor company might as well. But uh, I suspect uh, that um, you may, we may, I can't guarantee this, but I suspect that with good corporate governance, we may actually, once the data comes back, and that's why you do a sandbox, may find, as has been the case, I think, in the UK and so far in Utah, that there are actually fewer, in, in terms of real data, that there are actually fewer instances of that kind of abuse um, for the companies participating in the sandbox and post sandbox than the proportion of attorneys who, uh, who, who may do so. So I don't think um, so far, just speaking from data, um, there's, there's no evidence to support that theory in actual practice. Tom. Hi, Charlie. Tom Green. I, I apparently am the only person that doesn't know you already. Um, so I, I've got basically- We have to fix that, Tom. Yeah, I know. Uh, you're probably in San Francisco, right? That building looks very familiar. Um, so three, three questions. Um, the first one is, I know in the UK, they have this head of practice requirement. So there's somebody inside the system that makes sure all the lawyers follow the rules. It, it, you guys are subject to that, right? Uh, I, I think we are. Uh, I'm not the general counsel. Um, but potentially to, add, to potentially take the question in another direction, we have an excellent general counsel. Um, and um, our practice is that he, uh, and eventually, because we've thought about this, the CFO, who have different fiduciary duties than the uh, now I'm a core I am a corporate lawyer and I care deeply about good governance and so as this evolves we've thought a lot about what um, quasi independent role the general counsel can play from the business uh, management which is me and others and um, and and potentially the CFO as well so we're, we've thought about it that way and. Um, are, and the business people um, tend to not get super involved with the attorney oversight, if at all. Okay. And then two sort of semi-related questions. That how do you make sure that the algorithmic, the tech side provides good services to the people who use it? That's one. And then is there some switching process? Is, is there some off-ramp the tech reaches a, um, a point at which it can't do the job you think is appropriate and then switches to the lawyers? Is there something like that in your system? Absolutely. Um, and, and I love it. So, so Rocket Lawyer, I'm just speaking for Rocket Lawyer. Yeah, sure. we, we have plenty of competitors who do things in, yeah. in a variety of ways. But, um, but, but our, our um, system is patented and it's, it's, it's a patented invention. Um, and from the very beginning, uh, we thought people really needed licensed attorneys. Um, and so before Rocket Lawyer, there were a number of uh, issues around unauthorized practice of law. 
And um, part of the invention of Rocket Lawyer was to try to um, solve that problem. And mm -hmm. so we always, every screen um, gives a person an opportunity to interact with a licensed attorney, literally every screen. And, um, and, and so uh, it's more than figuring out when they should, it's in, in our system, it's more um, giving them an opportunity to opt out because we think they always should. Um, and we have from, from day one. Um, I'll stop there for a second. Okay. So why don't you give me an example? So I, say I'm a small business, I want to incorporate. I presume I go to your site and you, I can fill out a form. In that process, is there some switch out to the lawyers or the what you use is this button at the bottom right or wherever that might be? I want so, to talk to a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. so we don't do forms. Um, yeah. We do uh, questions and answers. So people, uh, the, the system asks uh, a question. You answer the question when, when, when you ask, you know, if you were to say, Charlie, um, how can regular people fill out legal forms? I would say they, most of them can't, but any of us can answer simple questions about ourselves and our situation and then be guided. And so um, every one of those questions um, says, hey, are, would you like to interact with a lawyer now? Um, they can call us and we will, um, help them to interact with the lawyer if they, if they desire to. So um, uh, that's, that was the original invention behind uh, service. And, and, and absolutely, if I was to say, um, our invention was to counter two things. One, the proliferation of legal forms without legal help. <laughs> and two, legal help being provision by not being delivered by non-lawyers. We wanted to fix both of those. We wanted people to be able to get the help that we knew they needed and to get it from somebody who's licensed. Okay. And then I take it the problem for you really, I mean, you mentioned this, is just since you're a public, since you're incorporated, you have an equity interest in all of this. So that's the, the ethics problem for you guys? I don't think we have any ethics problem. I, 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 I think we operate today with independent attorneys. Um, and uh, what we can't do in California is to hire attorneys, which actually our experience in other places is when we can hire attorneys, the overall customer experience is uh, better. And mm -hmm. um, that's because we, we can deliver the tools and the training, um, which is mostly what it is. It's that, you know, if you need a lawyer to help with these basic sorts of things that, that, that our uh, employee attorneys do, um, we help to train them so that they're good at working with people online. Okay. so. I don't want to dominate, but so you are operating in California because you had a San Francisco example. And the difference, the thing you would like to do is to employ attorneys as opposed to contract with attorneys. Is that kind of the deal? Uh, the thing we'd like to do is to uh, be able to offer California consumers uh, the same uh, custom solution that we can in other places. And by custom solution, I mean, if the best uh, uh, service for them in terms of cost and uh, outcome is to work with an employee attorney, then that's what happens. And if the best uh, service is with an independent attorney, then that's what happens. In California, we're just limited to the independent attorney solution right now, which, which still isn't um, optimal for every Californian. Got it. Thank you, Charlie. Very helpful. Before we move on to the next question, can you say something about how you decide 
which is optimal, where you have the choice, which is optimal, an independent attorney or a, an employee attorney? What kinds of matters do you, or questions or issues do you put in either direction? Yeah, we don't decide, the, the customer decides. And so the customer um, gets more options and more choice and the customer decides. So the customer gives us um, a description and they can get, they can have an initial consultation about their matter. Um, they can decide, uh, they, they, uh, they'll often be offered an opportunity to talk with an, another attorney um, they can take us up on that. There's no additional cost associated with that consultation. They can they can choose to do that or not to do it, and they can choose um, which uh, solution they want to uh, they want to have. Thank you, Marta. Thank you. Um, so you earlier um, you mentioned that there were artificial hurdles to the delivering of, I guess, legal services, I, I suppose, in a traditional model. What are those or what do you consider those to be and what are you doing differently? Uh, hey, Marta, um, just making sure, Hi. <laughs> Hi. just making sure that I um, uh, understand uh, where we where we were, um, I think when I was talking about artificial hurdles, I I meant um, the fact that we can't offer a vertically integrated solution to somebody who has a relatively simple matter like what's in my the slide I showed, um, which is going to be most efficient for them and um, for. Uh, a lot of people, cost is the is the main difference between whether they um, get legal help or they don't, and it's it's all cost and ability to pay. So um, when when we uh, often uh, people slip through the cracks, um, and it's a shame because the independent attorneys just can't help them given the cost. They just they don't they don't want to take on that particular piece of work because of the cost, and so this is another tier that we have in Utah that we have in the UK, where um, uh, we're able to architect a solution that can be delivered at a cost that uh, folks can afford. So that's what I I mean um, when you when you add the additional complexity, you add cost. Um, and the attorneys, um, uh, we're trying, why I really like the term closing the gap is um, we identified gaps years ago. And again, the UK was the first place we could close the gap where um, we had a relatively affordable solution with the independent attorneys, but it just didn't work for, for most people still. I don't mean some, I mean, I mean most, that's 70% number that I talked about earlier. And um, the, the fact of the matter is that 70% number exists right now in the system we currently have. So I guess that's what I was referring to um, by, the, the, by needing to go to a, in order to close that gap, the tools exist, the tools certainly exist. What doesn't exist is the regulatory framework in which the tools can be deployed. So Donna, oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. I just have a quick follow-up. So if if I'm hearing you correctly, and in particular with respect to my question, and I think your answer to Tom's question earlier, if Rocket Lawyer, if if a customer decides that they want to stay with Rocket Lawyer rather than being referred to, I think you're calling them an independent lawyer, that you refer them outside of Rocket Lawyer. Obviously, it, it, I just want to make sure I'm correct on this. If they stay with Rocket Lawyer, Rocket Lawyer is going to make more money as opposed to the fee going out to, or that, that customer being referred out to an independent lawyer. Is that correct? Not necessarily. Why isn't that what, 
why isn't that that absolute yes or no? Because when you change the rule, you also change the rule with respect to fee sharing with the independent attorneys as well. So, and I, and, and that's a really good thing. Um, and that's going straight to your question. Um, Californians, because of these antiquated things, fee, fee splitting is a perfect example. Californians don't get access to lawyers. Um, with the regulatory reform, you actually eliminate um, the issue that you just described. So it's a really good one. Okay, thank you, Donna. Thank you. Um, I was just curious, um, since you had mentioned that you support partnerships with One Justice, uh, with some local legal aid programs, um, if you can describe one of those partnerships for us, Charlie. Oh yeah, um, love it. So um, as I mentioned, uh, Pro Bono Net, um, which is an organization been around for a couple of decades. Um, um, I, I joined the board of Pro Bono Net uh, last year and um, I look forward to some, and there's a public announcement. I really look forward to some cool stuff that we can do with potentially um, opening up some of our technology um, purely for uh, pro bono uh, use. And so lawyers who wanna donate their time, for example, um, which I think will be a, just a really exciting uh, potential project. Um, and other, and I encourage other, you know, legal tech companies to do things like that. Um, uh, we've done everything from, you know, hosting casino night here in our office when, you know, before the zombie apocalypse that we're finishing up now, <laughs> people could be here uh, for, for one justice. Um, for, uh, again, the, the uh, American Bar Association, we operated a pilot program. We're participating in another uh, ABA project right now uh, um, along that has to do with um, some of the reforms we're talking about here in other states. Um, we have uh, contributed a portion of our revenue to legal aid um, in, uh, in San Francisco as well as in uh, Los Angeles. And I think um, as, or it's, it's, it's one of our real goals as the company grows um, that we'll be able to do more of that. And having this combination of, uh, because Rocket Lawyer is a for-profit um, company um, and you know, Justice Ginsburg talked about, at one point she used this language that I just love about her, 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 most, fervent, her most fervent wish. And if I was gonna say what mine is, and what's shared by our team, it's that as we grow, we can reinvest some of these uh, profits into, again, like I said, I've yet to meet the group. We didn't share the same mission, but we can reinvest it into uh, folks who helping people who don't have any ability to pay, which um, is, uh, heartbreaking in, in our society. So, um, is, so is the pro bono platform that you're describing, is that something that's, that's sort of in process of being developed or is that, is that a, a, a wish list kind of thing? Uh, it's not a wish list. Um, it, pro bono needs the same kind of tools. I mean, that's where public-private partnership can be really exciting, right? Um, pro bono needs the same kind of tools that we've um, built already, and um, and it's crystal clear. There's there's millions upon millions of people. Just look at what's going on with a uh, landlord tenant right now. And there's millions and millions of people who have no who don't have the ability to pay, and um, that's a different problem that uh, NGOs. You know, I, I, I was one of the founding board members of TechSoup, really proud of that. And NGOs, uh, TechSoup delivers technology to NGOs, started here in San Francisco, down the street by Daniel Binhorn, and has grown into one of the biggest uh, providers of technology to NGOs. Um, 
And so uh, we think it's going to take those kind of uh, partnerships. The only thing that um, government really has to do is to have regulations and, you know, we're a legal platform, so we're not anti-regulation by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> it's just have regulations that make sense, that foster innovation. Um, and, uh, and then I think that we can address folks who need affordability and use the same platform and others to address folks who need uh, pro bono. And they're, they're different. And, and these, these are forms, that's honestly the only way that I think the people who desperately need pro bono are going to be able to get it. Thank you. Thank you. I think Neil has a question. Yeah, thanks. And Ma Micah has the last one. <laughs> so Charlie, thanks again for your presentation today. Um, so it strikes me that um, you're kind of unique in that you've got a model that predates the Utah sandbox and now you're in the sandbox. So I'm curious whether you folks have any data showing that now that you spent about a year in the Utah sandbox, showing how your, your integrated services there are less costly for consumers than uh, in your traditional model. Do you, do you have that kind of data and, and what does it look like? Um, I'm sure we do. I'm sure we do. I don't have it at my fingertips, um, but uh, I'm happy to, to talk to the team and I'll say um, we provide uh, updates to the Utah uh, Supreme right. Court, to their task force mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And um, I don't see any reason why um, that data couldn't be made available here as well. Yeah, I think we'd be very interested in seeing that. So thanks. Thank you. Micah. Neil asked one of the questions that I was going to ask. So I'm left with just one simple question. Do you sell any of the data that you collect? Never. Okay. All right. Well, we were told you had only until 145 and we managed to bring it in at 144. Charlie, I really appreciate you being with us and sharing uh, the story of what you've been able to accomplish and what you'd like to do in California. And I appreciate your offer to uh, allow us access to the follow-up data. We will um, be in touch first with the Utah Sandbox folks and then perhaps with your uh, office as well. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for the work that you're doing. Um, it's, it's super important work and um, we're, I'm honored that you thought of us to, to uh, we, were, we were somebody you wanted to hear from. Um, and, um, uh, as far as the data sharing, I, I think that uh, you're right to check with the, the Utah team, um, but to the extent that they don't have an issue with it, I don't think we do either. Super. Thank you. Okay. Have a Take good care. rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm tempted to offer everybody a break, but we have such a busy schedule. What I'd like to do instead is to revert to where we were on uh, the, we're still on the first agenda item, believe it or not. So I'd like to revert to the first agenda item to the discussion we were having um, and to get through the first agenda item before we take uh, a, a short break. Okay, thank you, Justice Speaker. So when we left off, uh, I had, made a proposal about splitting this number two into three sections just to mostly just to provide ease of voting but I know that um, Micah and John had their hands up at the time that we broke so I want to make sure that we get to them Micah there was a comment now I can't remember who because it was before lunch um, by someone maybe it was Tom who indicated that uh, three and four take care of the competence issue um, that we've been kind of grappling with, but three and four only apply to licensees. Um, and so we still need some sort of standard that's going to apply to non-licensees whereby they should uh, have to meet some basic level of competence. So that's why I think it's necessary for this language to be in two. Um, John? 
I don't have anything at this point. Fine, if you want to call the questions, Mary. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, I'm not sure that Eric, as the maker of the motion, and Toby as the seconder, uh, agreed with my proposal to split number two into, you know, effectively two A, two B, and two C, as shown on the screen. Um, Toby, I haven't actually consulted you with you on this, but. Um... I was only going to make one slight addition, unless Toby has an objection, which is Lucy also uh, had a, uh, a sort of an additional, I guess we'd call it amendment, which was to remove the very first part of this uh, statement, which is for the purposes of the admission to the regulatory sandbox. Um, I, actually, I don't know if we want to do that as an amendment after the fact, if we sort of vote and then take it, or if we'd like to have that be a, I don't know, that part A, B, and C. Um, but it did just occur to me there were kind of there were, I think, three changes to this that were sort of offered, and we sort of left Lucy's out. And so, Eric, that, right? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that we not do uh, amendments after the fact. As the motion maker, it will be up to you whether you would like to take that language that's just been highlighted out, in light of the language that's later provided, or whether you want to leave it in. Toby, I think I'm leading towards uh, taking it out, but um, I'm viewing you as the partner in this. So uh, tell me what you think. <laughs> I, I guess my, my inclination is to say that, the, that that really differentiates it, that this is saying, before you get in, here's what you have to show. And then the later parts say, once, once you're in, here's what you have to do. One, one follow-up question on that. Toby, which was, there's a footnote one that then would seem to cover everything that's in the next two uh, uh, bullets, right? So, so it, if we're taking that position, then, and this is not really, I don't know if this changes your statement, but it, it seems like that footnote one then takes care of the, the, the one of the two amendments to the uh, language as we've written. It. If, like, if we're, if we're clarifying that this is only for the initial purpose, then I don't know that we need the rest of the amendment, other, the, the other two amendments. Okay, well, you guys think about that. Let okay, me just sorry. get the rest of the comments. Uh, Tom? You're on mute. You're on mute. Today. Um, I would have, find it impossible to vote for what is now 2A by itself. So if you could sort of start from the bottom and work up in terms of your process. I think of these as perfecting amendments. So at least in some <laughs> rules of, of legislative procedure, one does perfecting amendments before you get to the original amendment, but that would be just one guy's view. Bridget? Yeah, I just as the drafter and following this discussion, um, I think I, I added the language that said for purposes of admission and the and the in the footnote because i was trying to clarify that it was separate from the standard of care discussion that we've had as far as professional liability goes and i'm a little just, i'm a little concerned that this conversation has taken a turn away from the intent of this which is really meant to be the regulatory principle it, just to reiterate what i've said earlier we're, we're going to get to the point where we're really talking about the level, assessing the risk that each provider is going to give and looking at how we're gonna protect consumers with respect to each provider. But this is getting back to, I think Lucy pointed this out and what Stacey Butler was talking about. This is just, how are we looking at the experience of the consumer here? What are we worried about protecting them against? That's what the first part was. And according to what, like measuring it according to what? And what we're just measuring it against is, is this, is it riskier for this person to have nothing at all or, or to at least have access to this provider? And that's what we're comparing the risk to. How we're going to assess that risk and how we're going to address it is a separate discussion. And so it seems that when we're getting to this competency part, and this is just, just I'm bringing this up because I think it's kind of veering away from the, the regulatory approach that this was designed to say. So 
I think when I wrote for purposes of admission to the sandbox, my intention was just to distinguish it from the standard of care, but it wasn't act, I, I think that was inartfully worded because I wasn't trying to establish a new criteria for entry. I was trying to establish still this regulatory principle of recognizing that so many people do not have legal services at all. So I don't know if that helps or hurts this motion, but I just wanted to add that. Uh, okay, uh, Eric and Toby, have you reached a and in, in taking into account the comments that you just heard from Bridget and Tom? Hey, Toby, here, here, here goes a try number two. If we follow Tom's uh, proposed procedure where we vote starting with the, the, um, the bottom and working our way up, could the last one be to, to remove the, the um, for the purposes of admission to the sandbox language? So that we would sort of work our way up in these votes, so that the first would be vote on the standard of care, second would be uh, competency, and third would be removal of the admission purposes uh, for the purposes of admissions to the sandbox. So that if then the last vote would simply be the risk of harm uh, to the consumers would be measured relative to the experience of the consumer consumer would have had in the absence of legal services provided. Yeah, I think actually the the the, the fourth one would be everything to combined as it ends up passing. So yeah, if, I guess that's right. Yeah, so, so the, the, the fourth vote would be, now that we've made the amendments, here's the whole thing. Uh, well, I don't, why don't we keep this to three votes, but I think yeah. we're ready to start with the uh, third sentence in number two. If Mimi would call the question as to whether people accept or don't accept the third sentence to number two. Okay, and this is still a motion that was made by Eric and Toby. So yeah, yeah. Maybe just to be clear, if if you if you say accept, then uh, the language stays as it as it is in the third line. If you say reject, then that goes away. Uh, it means yeah. We'll see if it passes if the motion passes or fails. If it fails, then it's not part. It's not accepted or. Approved. I'm just wondering how how if you are against that language, do you vote yes or no? <laughs> you vote no if you're against. Okay. Oh, I mean, well, Eric, it's it's your motion. So if your motion is to approve the language highlighted here, then you vote no if you don't like it. And you know, yeah. So so if I if I don't like that language, vote no. Yes, but hopefully you wouldn't do that because you made the motion to approve this language. But you, you can, can do whatever he wants. Yeah, 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 actually, I, I didn't make the motion to approve that language. Okay, then I need someone like, to make a motion to approve this sentence. I don't want to make a motion to approve that language. Okay. I, I, I would I make a, a motion. I have a question, too. Uh, What's your question, Micah? I'll second Wendy's motion. Are we going to vote on what's highlighted now and then separately the sentence so, above and then the separately the sentence above that? So yeah. let me let me frame what I think we're doing. We're going to decide now whether to adopt a paragraph two, but we're going to decide what paragraph two should look like in three separate votes. The first question is, should paragraph two include this, this last sentence, standard of care related sentence, and that will either pass or fail. Then the next vote will be, should paragraph two include the middle uh, sentence, and then the third vote will be, should paragraph two in, uh, include the first sentence, I think Eric will say, minus the first phrase. And if we don't get a majority on that third vote, there won't be a paragraph two because the second and third sentences are just uh, improvements on them. But we'll at least understand what everybody's position on these three sentences is. Uh, well, I, I don't know if that's true. I think this is... Uh overly complicated. Does that mean the sentence that's after the number two would be voted on as it stands right now, which says conflictingly probably that um, relative to the experience the consumer would have absent the uh, legal services provided, it would include that language? We'll clarify it when we get there, but my understanding is it will not include the part that's now highlighted if we uh, adopt number three and number two, whether or not it'll include that language if we don't adopt number three and number two, uh, or, or C and B remains to be seen. 
You're right, it's unusually complicated, but that's because people proposed a bunch of amendments after we had a proposal on the ground. And my understanding was that Eric was prepared to have us go ahead and vote on the individual uh, proposed amendments. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure you don't mean to suggest that people adding amendments um, was unnecessary, but let's, I'll, I'll be quiet now. Okay, Eric? I just wanted to clarify one point. I and I don't think this changes. I'm fine with what you're proposing to do. I just did not support the last, uh, the, the standard of care. Um, I, I agreed to the, the second one, but that last one was added um, and, and I didn't agree to that. I'm happy well, to have the vote you're proposing, but I just Okay, if you're clear. happy to have the vote you're, that I'm proposing, then I'm gonna say you've accepted it for purposes of our voting on it. As long doesn't as I can vote against have, it. Doesn't mean you're, you know, of course you're welcome to vote against it. All right. So we are just voting on this sentence. That's what, we're doing. That's what we're doing right now. So if you want this sentence included in whatever we're going to adopt on number two, if anything, then please vote yes. And if you don't want that sentence, please vote now. And this is the motion made by Wendy Musell and supported, seconded by Micah Star Liberty. I just need it for the record. Correct? Is that fair, Wendy and Micah, that you would like this propose, proposal voted on as part of paragraph two? Yeah. Okay. Just, I just need it for the record. All right, Marta Alkenbrock? Yes. Andrew Arruda? Judge Irma Asbury? Mary Baldwin? Yes. Judge Wendy Chang? No. David Engstrom? No. Tom Green? Yes. Dan Grunfeld? Yes. Eric Helen? No. Kathy Huang? Yes. Uh, Micah Star Liberty? Yes. John Lund? Yes. Kevin Moore? Wendy Musell? Yes. Crispin Passmore? No. Lucy Rica? No. Toby Rothschild? No. Becky Sandifer? No. Jim Sandman? No. Patricia Scatiero? No. Sacha Steinberger? No. Thank you. The motion does not carry. Okay, then we will delete the third sent. Well, for now, the, th the third sentence did not uh, did not pass. We'll talk about the second sentence. Uh, we may as well go straight to a vote. I think the conversation was finished. So the question is now whether this second sentence should be included in paragraph two. If you'd call the roll, please. Okay. Sorry. And who is making this motion? That was Eric. That was me. That was you. Okay. Just want to make sure. And Toby, you seconded it? Yes. Okay. Just for clarification. Thank you. All right. Marta Alkenbrock? Yes. Andrew Ruda? Judge Irma Asbury? Mary Baldwin? Yes. Judge Wendy Chang? Yes. David Angstrom? No. Tom Green? Yes. Dan Grunfeld? Yes. Eric Helland? No. Kathy Huang. Yes. Micah Star Liberty. Yes. John Lund. No. Kevin Moore. Wendy Musell. Yes. Crispin Passmore. No. Lucy Rica. No. Toby Rothschild. Yes. Becky Sandifer. No. Jim Sandman. No. Patricia Scutiero? Yes. Sacha Steinberger? No. Hold on, I need a moment to count. One, two. Motion carries 10 to 8. Okay. Now I'm going to, now that we know what the motion. What, what happened to sentences two and three? I'm going to ask the motion maker, do you want to leave uh, the first sentence as it is, or do you want to take out the phrase before the comma? Toby, I'd like to take the phrase out, but uh, what do you think? We're in this together. I'd, I'd like to leave it in. So uh, maybe somebody else can second your motion to take it out and we can... I, I think we're going to say that the, the friendly amendment was not accepted by the original mover and seconder. I, I, I'm going to go with that as well. I think it stays as is then. Okay. And so the vote is going to be, uh, do you accept paragraph two as it now stands, which is the part that's in black and the footnote 
and the thing in blue that's been added. All right, so this is the whole the whole shebang. Any questions about what we're voting on? Hearing none, Mimi, please call the roll. All right, Marta Alkenbrock? No. Andrew Ruda. Judge Irma Asbury. Mary Baldwin. Yes. Judge Wendy Chang. Yes. David Engstrom. Yes. Tom Green. Yes. Dan Grunfeld. Yes. Eric Kelland. Yes. Kathy Huang. Yes. Micah Star Liberty. Uh, no. John Lund. Yes. Kevin Moore. Wendy Musell. No. Crispin Passmore. Yes. Lucy Rika. Yes. Toby Rothschild. Yes. Becky Sandifer. Yes. Jim Sandman. Yes. Patricia Scutiero. Patricia, are you still there? Sacha Steinberger. No. Thank you. Motion carries. All right, thank you. So uh, do you wanna lead us through, um, Mary? On sure, sure. Three, so. three and four are certainly related. Maybe we can discuss them together. Yeah, well, and, and in fact, um, I, I don't, I would hope that number five, um, well, number five is sort of subsidiary to the others and uh, would I would hope wouldn't be too controversial. So in the interest of time, let's talk about them all together. And unless it seems like we need to have separate votes, perhaps we can vote on the three of them together. We'll see. So um, why don't I just open it up for uh, discussion? Becky? So um, my understanding of what we're doing is we're identifying the issues that would guide a regulator's assessment of the risk level of an entity. So is it a high risk entity, a medium risk entity, a low risk entity? And so in, in the language of social science, those are things that are variables, right? So you might have 100% non-lawyer ownership or 50% non-lawyer ownership or 0% lawyer ownership, right? And that might be something that you take into account in assessing upon entry, the riskiness of the activity. But three and four are just statements about entry into the sandbox that have nothing to do with the assessment of the risk to the entity. And so my, my question is really, why are they being considered here and not somewhere else in the design? And I know that you will have thought about that. So I would just like to understand that better. Does anybody want to respond? Well, I'll take a shot at that, Mary. I, I think it just it's context, Becky, that to kind of have one and two make sense to the group uh, about regulatory approach, it seemed important to articulate this element of lawyers who are in the sandbox needing to still comply with their ethical responsibilities, unless you know there've been some specific waiver, and and likewise the entity. So I think it's it and uh, and then five kind of follows from that. I, I would tend to agree with you. It's not it's not helping with regulatory approach, but it's to some extent, the um, foundation upon which elements one and two are then able to work. Thanks. Wendy? Uh, the issues regarding three and four um, and five really, I, is the same ones that I had indicated in my comments, which is the issues of the separation of powers and ad hoc rulemaking, instead of having what rules would be um, waived up front, um, determining on a case by case basis by the regulator, uh, which ones will be waived per entity. And so uh, the parts of the sentences that except to the extent that compliance with specified rules is waived as a condition of entry into the sandbox, that occurring after the fact, I think raises the same separation of powers issues that I've raised previously. I also think that's ad hoc rulemaking that is not in the best interest of the consumer and no other regulatory environment that I'm aware of 
functions in that way. Okay, Tom? You're on mute. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, this is more of a question. So laws presumably are laws at the time these decisions are made. I mean, I, I think a premise or a context here is that you know, various parts of the business and professions code will need to be amended to, if, to enable the, the bar to do these things because they don't currently have the authority to do the several of these the most important aspects of this. So I think, is it my understanding that laws means laws at the time the sandbox exists and make its, makes its decisions? Question mark? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the, the distinction between rules and laws, rules would be, you know, rules of professional conduct um, that would be, and that this does address Wendy's point, um, laws are statutes, which of course there are a number of laws that govern attorneys in California and footnote um, three, um, which is referenced here somewhere uh, down at the, okay, um, at the, it's, the footnote is, is specifically appended to number five, but it, you know, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, there's no contemplation. The, the legislature would have to uh, take the action that would be required to waive the application of laws. And the, how specifically that would happen, we don't purport to you know, devise here, but we recognize that would have to be the case. Okay. So basically the, 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 the gloss that we see in footnote three applies to three, four, and five. Uh, yes, right. It would, I mean, five is, is basically, uh, I think, sort of explaining some, that application of uh, how that applies to, to uh, three and four. Um, Toby? Yeah, a couple of things. First of all, it seems to me that the essence of a sandbox is to allow a wide range of innovation and uh, uh, testing of different possibilities. The idea that we could upfront say these are these rules can be waived and only these rules and everybody has to follow that pattern uh, undermines the whole sense of what a sandbox is. Uh, I think that it's reasonable for the legislature to say these these statutes can't be waived. You, know, you can't waive 60680. You can't waive confidentiality. You can't waive certain other statutes. Uh, but I, my sense is that it would be reasonable for the legislature, if it chose to do so, to say, within the range of things, of other things, we authorize the court in a case-by-case -case basis to, to authorize that. And what I would like to suggest, because I think there's a, a legal issue here that we're not necessarily all experts on, maybe none of us other than Wendy are, uh, that if we asked... Uh, Brady and his colleagues at the Office of the General Counsel to come up with a memo for us saying, can this be done? How could it be done so that we have a better sense as we move forward on what we can and can't do in this regard? Uh, my other comment uh, is that on number three, and I, I guess three talks about lawyers in the sandbox, four talks about entities. The question is, are there other options? Could you have a non-lawyer individual in the sandbox uh, who's not an entity unless entity is defined in a very broad way? Uh, so and if, if that's true, we could add a word or two to, to cover that, but uh, that would be my comment. Okay, John? Uh, I, I agree with Toby on the idea that we ask Brady's group to follow up on the question of mechanism. I, I think that's really what our subcommittee anticipated in, in putting paragraph five in there is, is that th there does need to be more work done on that specific as to the logistics. And I, for one, would really welcome the kind of interchange with the, with the legislature around that that um, would help us move this forward. Um, but that said, I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion that we advance these three, four and five as written as part of the recommendations of the working group. Is there a I'll second? I'll second that. John, seconded by Eric. Okay, next uh, with the hand up, Bridget. Sorry, thanks. Um, I, I think 
that would be a good idea too to have uh, OGC do a, a memo about it. I think what we talked about in the sandbox, I mean, in the Sage Working Group was possibly we could come up with a recommendation as a working group about the the a set of rules and laws that are on the table obviously would have to be in conjunction with the legislature and discussion with them. I think we talked about this before. There's, you can't, we can't, nobody can waive a statute without the legislature being involved. They could author, you know, however that happens, we have every intention of going through the legislative process for any kind of changes to the business and professions code. It's gonna have to happen in some way, shape or form. And OGC could give us some examples of how that might happen, but, um, we could come up with a list of what's on the table anyway. And maybe Wendy, I wonder if that might help alleviate your concerns, but then that's not necessarily like, it's not like all of those things would be waived for every sandbox applicant. Maybe only, you know, one of those things would be waived. Um, but, you know, we could kind of at least have a universe defined of what might be, you know, up for testing in the sandbox. As some, we kind of talked about that as an option. Um, not not in detail, but we did mention that during this subcommittee meeting. So I wanted to say that. And another thing, uh, just to respond to something that Wendy had said earlier, was this isn't this is a new way of regulating. So you're you're right. There aren't. This isn't the way that other regulators operate, and that's because this is a different. At least in California, they don't. We we don't have a model of risk based regulation yet. This is something that would be different. So we aren't going to find parallels by looking at the way other. Um, regulars are working right now. Uh, Marta? Um, this is a brave new world. This is, uh, and, and frankly, frightening for me that we would have a regulator operating within our state that can waive laws that would be applicable to lawyers or entities participating in a sandbox. That kind of terrifies me. And I think that, uh, to Bridget's point, we don't have that um, yet. And I don't know that we could or should. Um, that's a huge question. And I think we need, um, to Toby's point and others that have seconded after him, we need some guidance here. And I would suggest that we'd want to table three, four, and five before we start going down a path that is, uh, like I said, entering into a brave new and frankly scary uh, place with respect to uh, people participating in the sandbox and, and the ability of a regulator to, to waive what statutes apply to those participating in it. That's, that's huge amounts of power and, and I'm very concerned about that. Thank you. I just, want to, I just want to say one thing in response to that real quick, if you will. If we go back, we talked about this charter before, and I think it's worth revisiting. I mean, it really is within our charter to do to at least come up with this framework. The charter specifically says, looking at Rule 5.4, developing a regulatory sandbox, and this is what this group has been charged with doing. And so, I, as far as these particular statements are really just saying that, you know, unless otherwise waived, in in a process that we still have yet to determine. The people that are lawyers are still going to be subject to the rules of professional conduct and entities that are operating in the system are subject to that rule, those rules as well. That's, and then we still have to come up with the framework, but really this is just meant to be a statement that just because you're operating the sandbox doesn't mean you don't have to comply with the rules of professional conduct. That's really all these statements are saying. And, and, and briefly in response, my concern is that we are making as this, this uh, working group, we're making recommendations with respect to the regulators that are eventually going to take these words and try to figure out what to do with them. My, that's my biggest concern. And I don't feel comfortable making a recommendation without legislative input as to whether or not this can even be done because we are granting, we are rather, we are recommending giving the regulators huge amounts of power. And that's my concern. I'm gonna jump in here and say that we have an agenda that is longer than we are going to be able to get through. And we have a recommendation to get some additional legal advice uh, before we vote on these, uh, on points three, four, and five. So I recognize there's a motion pending and I think the motion maker can overrule my suggestion. But my suggestion is that we uh, skip forward now to 
the next agenda item and that we come back to three, four, and five, informed by this discussion and by the memo that we're going to ask uh, Office of General Counsel at the Bar to prepare before the December meeting, so that at our December meeting we can uh, revisit with the benefit of, of that additional advice um, whether or not to vote up or down uh, items three, four, and five. So I forget who our motion yeah. maker was, but is that okay? Yeah, that's you. I, I was the motion maker. I'm honestly not sure you need the permission of the motion maker to table the motion, but I I, I, I don't not do not have any objection to that. My only thought would be that we get past the legal analysis and we get to some conversation with people at the legislative level around what they how they see this because if I know, may, since I'm the legislative designee. Could, could I just finish what I was saying, please, Wendy? Sure, but we have had some of those conversations, and let's, so I want the let's opportunity. John, let's have John finish out, then we'll have Wendy uh, respond, and then we'll go from there. But I'm really interested in something that moves us forward constructively around the subject of waiver. I think, you know, if you just look at the two examples today, Charlie Moore did not need a waiver for non-lawyers to provide legal advice. He needed a waiver solely of the question of ownership. By contrast, uh, Stacy Butler did not need something about ownership to be changed. She only needed this waiver around the supervision of the non-lawyer. So it absolutely, just fundamentally, the sandbox is going to involve that type of mm. uh, case-specific sort of, of decision-making around, around a particular applicant. And that's the piece that I'd like to have some open conversation with, with the legislature about as to where, they, where they're going to be comfortable with the discretion to do that being with the sandbox regulator when it ultimately gets stood up. Okay, Wendy. Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to share is we've already had some of these conversations. There already was a legal opinion when I originally brought up the separation of powers issues. Uh, there was communications and a meeting um, between members of the assembly and with the state bar. Additionally, there were some follow-up conversations that I had uh, with the attorney, uh, an attorney uh, uh, representing the state bar. Uh, and so some of these have already occurred and the legislature has already indicated their concerns uh, as it relates to separation of powers. I've already indicated that these are the concerns that the legislature has articulated and I've made it really clear that this is not my sole concern as Wendy Musell, but rather these are coming from the legislature. So I understand that um, those suggestions and the edits that I made regarding separation of powers issues, those came from the legislature. I've said it repeatedly. So, I mean, the legislature has um, indicated concerns that they have, um, it's been with the separation of powers issues as well as the ad hoc rulemaking. So I think it's great to have additional conversations, but to, um, but those have been communicated very directly. I've communicated those in written comments. I've stated this is what the legislature has, has indicated. Additionally, the legislature itself had meetings. Um, which stated they had the exact same concerns as I've been articulating. So I just want to be clear that this has been a, an ongoing concern that the legislature has been articulating. Um, and Wendy, can I ask for a point of clarification? When you said yeah. the legislature has had meetings where they've articulated these, can you tell yeah. us what meetings you're referring to? I was not present, at, but uh, the uh, I can get everybody's names and I'm happy to pass those along. It was the- Were these the, meetings open to the public? No, it was an acting, the uh, state bar, uh, the acting director of the state bar, president of the state bar, oh, oh, um, had these meetings. Uh, and so- Are you, I'm sorry, are you talking about like staff? Because as staff, we have met with this and with, with staff from right. assembly and- yeah, but the Judiciary Committees, we've met with staff to update them on what's happening. Is that what you mean, those meetings? Right, there's been meetings and this exact issue was discussed. This exact issue uh, was discussed. So I just yeah. wanna be upfront that, that, that 
you know, these issues have been raised as concerns. So it's not as if the legislature has not raised these previously. Um, and I, I appreciate that the, you know, this working group may come out a different way than the concerns raised by the legislature and that's its purview. But this does have to go to the legislature one way or the other for approval. So I just want to articulate again, I know I'm a broken record on this, um, but the things that I've put in writing regarding the uh, issues of separation of power, um, those, are, those are concerns that the legislature has. Additionally, um, ah, I lost it, I'm sorry. So I appreciate that. There was actually a legal memo. Um, that's and it was an excellent memo. There was a, uh, a it did go to the Assembly Judiciary Committee, and the Assembly had a different opinion as to the application of law for separation of powers. So uh, those have already happened, but I'm I'm happy to uh, continue to have those discussions. What, what's I, I, the legal memo that you're referring to? I was provided a legal memo um, and I'm happy to share uh, the communications that were sent to me because this, this issue was already, um, there was a request, I think it came out of our working group when I raised the separation of powers issue early on. And there was a request that this issue be looked into to see, you know, is there validity to this concern or not validity to this concern, which I did appreciate. I got a response back. Um, the judiciary, the Assembly Judiciary Committee um, provided concerns. Those concerns were raised in meetings with the state bar. So I just want, you know, transparency about this, that this is a discussion that has already been raised. So can um, I ask you, as you just volunteered that you would send us the communications you're referring to, can I ask that you do give that to somebody at State Bar staff um, so that we can make sure that that also goes to Brady for the benefit of the memo that he will be writing? We sure, do but right, these right originated, now. I'm just, it's somewhat confusing to me that this one already, the bar one already have this since this in part originated through the bar. Well, so, you're referring to communications that I don't, that I'm, when I mean, you say you got a legal memorandum and there was a response from the judiciary about the legal memorandum, I don't know what memorandum you're talking about and I haven't seen the response from the judiciary. So those okay. are the things I'm referring to. I'm happy to do that. I thought I had also provided them to you, but in any event, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide the memo that I received or that the email with the legal analysis is a better way to describe it. I consider it a memo, even if it's embedded in an email. I'm happy to provide that. Um, and the response, you know, I wasn't present at the meeting, but I know the meeting occurred. Uh, and then I know, was present. Can I just can I just say, can I explain what happened at least because I was at the meeting? Really, I think whatever I feel like we're all talking about possibly different things. Like maybe there's some some definitions that we need to address or something because I want to make sure that Brady and OGC is clear about what it is that we're asking them to write about. So, so, so Bridget, last, Bridget yeah. I want to jump in. Can we take this offline after the meeting? If Wendy could provide what she's got to Bridget and others at State Bar staff, please include me in that communication. And then we can get it all straightened out, and we can we can and also please include the uh, the sage co chairs in that communication. And then we'll get it all straightened out, and we'll get a formal charge to Brady for what we'd like him to advise us on um, after reviewing the communications that Wendy's referring to. Um, and if we could do that over the space of the next week or so, I, I would hope that would give Brady the time he needs to uh, have something in place before the next CTJG meeting. And I would really like to move to the next agenda item, but Micah has been very patient with her hand raised. So Micah, you get the last word before we close out this agenda item. Well, I don't know how patient I've been, but, but here we are. Um, first of all, going in reverse order, I think that everyone needs to have access to this information. The, the point, so it shouldn't just be to people who are in positions of chair or co-chair, it should be disseminated widely. Um, both 
chairs of judiciary in the assembly and the senate have raised in multiple meetings the same exact concerns and i just need to highlight wendy's point which is she has been telling us in written comments and in her verbal comments during these meetings direct uh feedback from the assembly and people argue with her or they criticize the comments so i would just suggest as wendy did that we stop and take uh seriously the comments that she's making particularly when she's telling us these are the concerns of the senate uh, assembly chair who appointed her that's it okay thank you i'm gonna gavel this segment of the meeting to a close and give everybody a short mid-afternoon break because we're going to have a couple more hours of work to do um, when we come back. When we come back, I'm going to uh, turn the meeting over again to our SAGE co-chairs to move on to the next agenda item, which is also a request for not just discussion, but action. Um, and after the, we have made as much progress as we can in a reasonable period of time on that we have further discussion further items that are for discussion but not action so i'm going to compress the those discussions and one of those is a um, an item about attorney involvement based on a staff memo and then the other are based on uh, memos and discussions that the scope committee has been holding because those are for discussion purposes and not action purposes uh, I'm going to, as I say, compress them a little bit, but we may also need to compress uh, our second agenda item, which we will get to in, let's give it seven minutes and come back at 2.35 for the remainder of the meeting. Super. Good. If we could have people come back and join us. I'm going to turn the mic back over to our SAGE uh, subcommittee, but ask that they uh, see what they can do with half an hour of time. I'd like to, to end the SAGE portion of the meeting at or shortly after 3 o'clock so that we can get to, well, let's say between 3 and 3.15 so that we can get to the other agenda items before the end of the, of the meeting. We will do what we can, Justice Tuker. Um, and if we only do part of it, that's that's what we got. Yeah, I think I have a little bit of a plan. Um, Mimi, just so you know, I'm going to need sheet eight of 105 and 101 of 105 up on the screen at some point, but not just yet. And this is of the memo on B. Uh, you said you want them on the screen at the same time? No, I just wanted to give a heads up. I, I want to get to them in a minute here. So, so. eight of 105 and what's the other one? 107. 107. Okay. Uh, give me a okay. minute. To split up. No, you don't need this very minute. Let me just let me just get things launched. So this is about the subject. Okay, we have these regulatory principles that we just got done kind of working through. This is the this is the conversation about how we would assess the risk that appears in a particular proposal, which you know they take various different sizes and shapes, and we need some kind of criteria or the, our committee feels there should be some sort of criteria being recommended framework, if you will, for the regulator to assess the apparent risk to consumers in a particular model. So um, in, the, in that conversation, uh, we have identified, if, if you look at on, on the, in the memo that we submitted, we came up with really five criteria that would be that we identified as as potentially being pertinent, and they're on the second page of the memo that supported this. But I'll just run through them. One is the level of ownership in the entity itself. Um, the next is the level of loyal involvement in the product or service that's being provided. The third was the nature of the service provided. You know, I, I guess in shorthand terms, how sophisticated is the type of service that's being asked about? Is it form filling out or is it, you know, a uh, much more complex type of legal advice? The fourth would be the sophistication level of the consumer. And the fifth would be the stakes. Uh, what's at stake in the, in the particular matter? A $2,000 debt issue might be different than something that affected child custody, for example. So. With, with that background, um, our recommendation about this, which I, 
Justice Tucker, maybe the one we were really able to get anywhere with or in, in terms of the time we've got today, there's sort of a, a, an either or being recommended in our recommendation number one. The, the, the first option is that, is that the regulator do initial risk assessment based on the Utah model, which is, I'm going to show you that on page eight of the, of the PDF in a moment. And the alternative is to take a somewhat broader look at risk. And that's what, what we'll look at for a minute under attachment C. So could we turn first to sheet eight of 105, Mimi? Um, is, it, is this what you're looking for? Sorry, I'm on the, that's Service it. Model risk right. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a somewhat, I, I guess I call it simpler model that, that Utah uses where, you know, the categorization there is just specifically by the sort of the model that's being involved. And you can see there's this difference between different percentages of ownership and the like. You have an intermediary platform, which is sort of a separate animal because that's that's just um, if if Rocket Lawyer weren't doing any actual representation of clients with its employees, if it was only just helping people get to lawyers and refer to them, that would be an intermediary type of a platform. And I, I think that's the basics of the of the way Utah does it. I didn't warn Eric about this, but if we could turn down to attachment C. Attachment C is, a, and that's this sheet. Well, think, yeah, that's the one. This is this is uh, something that Eric and I think Bridget helped put this together. Is a somewhat uh, uh, more involved model. And Eric, could you walk us through this just for a minute or two, please? Sure. Uh, so what Bridget and I were doing was how do these two interact? And in our subcommittee, we had a couple of of what if we sort of added more dimensions. And the way Bridget and I were thinking about this was if, if you always went with the higher risk level, what would that do, right? So if you have two dimensions and you're saying, you know, as I fill in this matrix, it might be low in one category, but then if, they're, if their service model uh, uh, involves a higher risk, we sort of kick it up sort of one level. And so what it says is that under this model, a lot of these, you know, the relatively few low or moderate risk, mostly, uh, basic legal information provided by um, uh, entities that were predominantly owned uh, by uh, lawyers, right? And then uh, you moved up to moderate risk and then high risk would be sort of direct legal advice. And so John, that was kind of all we were doing was we were saying, how do these two fit together? Uh, and then uh, we played around a little bit with, you know, could you do this with sort of additional dimensions and not surprisingly, what will happen is you will just shrink the number of, of low risk activities as you add more dimensions because uh, any entity that ends up providing something that's high risk on one dimension would sort of get bumped up. You could make this more complicated by thinking that there were perhaps trade-offs on these where uh, maybe it wasn't always the best idea to just move up one notch to being high risk. But uh, Bridget, I think, uh, does that summarize kind of how we were thinking about it? Yes, and as the memo talks about too, we, we talked about other areas um, that can be also addressed. And John, you might want to work through it. It, it gets to be, you can't, I mean, Eric can envision what kinds of like models you Three can use. that's it. <laughs> but this way, at least we can kind of take two, two different, like two different factors anyway, to create some kind of initial way to uh, assign a level of risk. And then you can take additional concerns that you may have like into, into consideration, but this is at least a starting point. Right, and I just, just, to, just to kind of see how that might apply, we, we all heard, you know, we heard about Rocket Lawyer today. That's an entity that's doing 50% or more non-lawyer ownership. So it's about right in the middle of the column there where it says 50% or more non-lawyer ownership. I think under the Utah model, Lucy will know better, they're either classified as low moderate or they're moderate for all aspects of what they do for people because of that model that they have. Under this approach, it appears the way that lays out, if the, the, the rocket lawyer lawyer were to get involved in doing discrete legal advice as distinct from negotiations or document completion, or were to be going into court, then that would bump the, uh, the service up into the high, the high risk range because of the nature of the service. If I got that right, Eric? Yeah, that's the way we were thinking about it. And, and what prompted this was um, reading through the documents from Utah on what they were asking people to collect in terms of information. And so kind of the way I think 
originally I was thinking about this was um, if if a lawyer uh, in Rocket Lawyer was conducting negotiations, um, they said, you know, we, we would actually have someone that was going uh, or offering in-court representation. Um, we would like more information on that. We would view that as something where we wanted a higher level of scrutiny than we would if they were simply providing basic legal information online or something like that. Right. And just to kind of complete the conversation, I wanted to focus on some one, but two in, recommendations two and three here um, really kind of build on that by, by adopting this. I think we, we take this from our friends over in scope by adopting this sort of step up approach, which is that on top of those things that we just talked about that would either be in the either of the two approaches we just talked about, then two and three would be, um, excuse me, maybe just two is this way. Um, two would be a step up if there was something about the level of the consumers that were being targeted or the nature of the services or what was at stake in the services uh, being provided that was that warranted a, an adjustment upwards in the model, as I understand that proposal. Um, and then the last point I'll make, and then maybe we could have some discussion is in both instances, either alternative, we wanted to make it clear and it's spelled out in the recommendation that by having these models that show different approaches, we're not recommending that each service model identified would necessarily qualify. So, you know, this is not the day to discuss whether there would be non-lawyers appearing in court, for example. That that that's not you're not voting in favor or against that in this particular uh, approach, even though some of those things are listed on the on the grids. Um, let's see, Mary, do you have anything that you uh, would want to add to that before we get some input from the group? If you're talking, you're on mute. Sorry, now. I'm on mute. No, that, that all sounds good. Okay. And then I don't know, do we have any comments that were specific to this topic, um, whereby written comments where we, we need to allow that person to provide some uh, first comments? I don't know of any. So I'm going to go to the first hand I saw, which is Tom. Thanks, John. You know, I keep looking at that antique thing behind you. It is just gorgeous, but <laughs> I, I, I won't deflect us. Um, I think I, 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 I need more insight here. So I understand your stack. So if it's lawyer owned, that's low risk and down the, down the list. But I'm not sure I understand why lawyer ownership lowers the risk necessarily. I mean, I, it, at least in California, if you are a supervising attorney, you're obligated to make sure your subsidiary attorneys and all of your employees follow the rules. But I'm, I'm not sure if a lawyer or even a group of lawyers are shareholders in a corporation, that kind of an obligation is triggered and they may just be profit maximizers Un, unencumbered by um, any kind of ethical obligation. Is, is the assumption here with your first step um, in this process that if a lawyer owns it, they will impose legal standards on everybody in the company? I, I think it's a working premise behind the model, but, but, for, but until we have data, you know, that will prove okay. these things out. I think the working premise is the closer the proposal is to traditional provision of lawyer services through law firms and lawyers, the less risky it logically seems like should be to consumers. That's just a premise. You know, I mean, I, I think we've heard people, some people say that's not necessarily how it works, but at least for assessing the potential risk, that's the starting place. Does that, I don't know if that answers your question. Sure. I mean, I, I, it seemed to me that was the assumption. I'm not sure there's a legal mandate to support that, at least here. But, you know, I, I understand what you just told me. Um, the other thing is, in terms of non-lawyer ownership or part ownership, um, and then that person or that entity manages the lawyer, is the assumption here that there would be a head of chambers, head of practice sort of person with an obligation to make sure that uh, the lawyer follows and all of the subsidiary lawyers follow the rules. Yeah, but I think that 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 um, is a somewhat different topic that I think is further down the agenda about having a compliance person within the entity that is is the accountable lawyer, so to speak. 
uh, but I don't know that that's built into the, the, the Utah model as it's presented here necessarily. Yeah, I see it as being in both places in the sense that if, if there is a head of chamber sort of structure as they have in Arizona with their ABSs, right. that, that seems like more of a guarantor that you know, the accountant or Hoover is the owner is not going to push anybody around or right. hopefully that would be true. So, right. and, I, okay. and I suppose, I suppose you could variation on that seem to say, if you have that sort of head of chamber in your proposal, then that affects where you fit on the risk profile, right? You know, now that you have something mm. like that, you, that puts you in a sort of, we perceive that as to be less risky than if you don't have that. Um, but anyway, Becky. Yeah. Thank you. So um, thanks for all of this really thoughtful work. Um, I just, just two observations. So the way I understand this is we're being, we're being asked to consider two different ways. So we've, we've come up with the four risks in the previous seven hours that we spent together today and finally voted. Um, and now we're thinking about, okay, so then entities come to us and we have to look at them and figure out where they fall in terms of their riskiness with respect to those four things. Are we going to try to figure that out? the way Utah does it, which is to use John's word, simple, um, or are we gonna use, I'm gonna call it the, the Eric Bridget model, which has more dimensions. Um, and I think there's a kind of intellectual attraction of the Eric Bridget model, <laughs> but then I think this has to be implemented by some office of people that are, that are collecting this information about organizations that are engaged in maybe many different kinds of activities. And so the one thing I would just encourage the group to think about is you can design an amazingly beautiful model in your mind, but then you have to apply it. And it may be that, that as beautiful as what Eric and Bridget have come up with, and I find many wonderful things about it, it might be kind of unworkable in practice and you might want something simpler. That's all. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that comes to mind, for example, if we you look at the rocket lawyer, does the fact that they would do discrete representation bump the whole rocket lawyer model up into some higher risk for everything they do? Or do we just make our regulator now have to regulate rocket lawyer as a moderate risk for some of what it does and then as a high risk for other things that it does? So I think that's the type of complication you're alluding to, Becky. Let's see, I see Eric's hand up. This is just a very short response. Um, and that is, I think Bridget and I were more, um, far be it for me to say that I am not guilty of designing really complex models that probably could never be implemented in practice. Um, but I, I think we were really thinking about what happens when the lawyer reaches one of those corners where it says low risk on one and, and medium on another. And, and so I think we were really trying to actually solve the problem that Becky is sort of identifying, which is, and I had thought of these as what level of scrutiny sort of on the, the, the data collected and so on, you know, as opposed to, we'll just never let anything in that's high risk. So I, I, I don't know that I would want to take this as a, find an area on that grid and say, this, this can never happen. As much as I would say, if, if you're going to do this, we would expect you to provide more information so that we could assess the risks of this. So I kind of like John's approach of saying, you know, these are more, you know, you called them variables earlier, but you know, they're, they're variables and we're, you know, we're trying to test them. And so as a first pass, you know, if, if rocket lawyer, you know, I like what Tom just said about putting in place, say a compliance officer who could be identified if that person was an attorney versus that person not being an attorney, to me, that would give the regulator a little more comfort uh, in saying, okay, maybe we, we don't need as much, um, you know, working with the, the folks at Arizona who, you know, have a lot of information on this. Uh, you know, and sort of are, are helping sort of collect the data, you know, maybe that makes Holy Cross seem sort of less risky than it otherwise would have been. So I, I was not really thinking about this as a block chunks of this out for, you know, don't do this as much as, you know, they have an idea of what level of regulatory scrutiny they would want to look at, what data they would want collected. And, you know, we could move these things around in lower high risk as the regulator proceeded. What do you think of that, Becky? I still would be interested to hear maybe from people in Utah who have implemented their simpler scheme, how they think it would be to implement the more complex one. Do we have any reflections on that from Lucy or someone like that? When the rubber hits the road, <laughs> um, how does it look? Um, 
I mean, I, I think more variables add more complexity, more time and more expense. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, and, and, and every every additional term that's added in requires additional sort of defining and assessing, you know, how do we, how do we measure for this? How do we measure, you know, how do we, how do we say what, what our objectives are around this piece of it? Um, like, what is a sophisticated consumer? What is, you know, what is an area of high impact versus low impact? Who gets to make that call? Those are a lot of questions that just remain to be dealt with. Um, so at the same time, you know, I, I think those are really interesting questions and, and potentially worthwhile um, considering in terms of the regulatory scope. I, I mean, maybe would say, could they be, could, is there a way to sort of, is there a way to consider them without completely undermining the efficiency of the process? Um, and maybe that's tears, I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to give it some more thought. Lucy, that's a little bit what I think was attempted in recommendation number two, which is to have those things listed as criteria yeah. that somebody could think about uh, but aren't necessarily, you know, built into a grid in a in a in a rigid way. But Neil, you've had your hand up for a while. What, what do you have? No, I, I was switching back and forth to having it up and or having it down. But uh, I guess what my real question is, I'm curious: does does Utah, when it does its initial risk assessment, does this specifically include the criticality of a legal service or the stakes of the services being provided? I, I can see a matrix where there's at least three variables that you're looking at. You're looking at the type of legal service being provided the model that's being offered an ownership uh, level of that model. And I, I really see that the criticality of the legal service is also maybe a Z variable. Um, does does Utah, Utah specifically integrate that as a variable? No, I mean, it, we do not, um, Utah does not. And, and part of it is, um, I think there could be a lot of relative, relativity built into that, you know, um, what may be critical to someone may not be critical to someone else, but um, not to say that it wouldn't be possible. I think, you know, you could think about a framework. I would just want to be really clear about the framework. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. I, I would think things, things like criminal and uh, child custody would be very high in terms of criticality, immigration, right? Um, but you're right, there may be some other gray areas where there's more difficulty in trying to- uh, Well, I think the other out. thing that happens there, Neil, is there's, there's this sort of tension between that issue and the need. Take the mm -hmm. domestic abuse victim. I mean, that's sure. obviously a high stakes issue. But yeah. do we want that to not be, you know, available? Because you know, so I, I think giving the regulators some guidance around that without creating, you know, a real hard and fast mechanism might might be a more effective way. But well, yeah, but see, also we're using this uh, risk level assessment to determine the level of data reporting too. That's right. So in, in my mind, that makes makes it extra important. So I see Wendy's hand up, and Tom, yours has been up for a while, but I don't know if that's a vestige. I had a further question, but go ahead with Wendy first. Go ahead, Wendy. Well, I don't want to jump the gun with Tom, but um, but oh. if you're allowing me to, okay. Uh, yeah, I applaud the the work that went into this, uh, particularly looking at levels of risk. I think that's important. My concern is uh, having particular areas included and particular. Uh, types of uh, entities included as opposed to general categories, um, more under the lines of in, you know, if you look at the legislative history of a, of a particular statute, if there's in the discussion, um, particular entities or uh, contemplated there, I think there's going to be an assumption that those are entities that we've all decided ought to be sandbox participants. So even even though I know there was this statement that uh, this includes software companies, et cetera, um, that it doesn't mean that we've decided to include them. I think if you include them on your model as to assessing risk, it's a de facto approval or it appears so to people who weren't in these eight to 10 hour meetings. So uh, I would just suggest I like that you're looking at risk in this way. I think it's meaningful, but um, that it be more general so that there's not um, an understanding that these are de facto approvals of those types of entities. 
I guess the question I have for you about that, Wendy, is then would you suggest we have no matrix with no examples or that we have a matrix that only has examples that we have agreed are okay? I mean, how would you approach that? Well, I think um, you can have a matrix that, for example, takes into account um, whether attorneys are providing the uh, legal services. You can have, if we do agree, or uh, it's passed that uh, paraprofessionals provide it with or without attorney oversight, those could be levels of approval. But I think this is more uh, specific. It, it includes software companies and the like. And so I think any sort of structure should be general enough that it has general application. And by application, I, I don't mean for an applicant, I mean uh, uh, to all of the individuals who would come within that matrix of being an applicant um, so that it, it can be determined as opposed to having, well, we think companies who do family law DV services are low because we've decided that that's a value that we wish to um, approve. And we may all wish to approve that at the end of the day. Um, but I think if we have something very specific uh, that's contemplated within what's proposed, I think it uh, assumes we have, again, the we're, well, we're definitely having those participants in the sandbox and that it's not general enough so that the regulator can utilize it in a meaningful way. But I do wanna say, I, I like the um, idea of having uh, risk assessment and information into the risk assessment. So I appreciate um, the work on that. Thanks, uh, Tom. Yeah, so I, I think this is more of a question. So a, a repeated trope is lawyer involvement. Yeah. Um, and as far as I can tell, the, the place where that's defined is on page 24 in footnote 12, which says, denotes a range of activities, guidance on initial development of forms, could mean sample reviews of product service performance, uh, could mean available to advise as needed, including red flag trap doors in software. What, I mean, it, it, Lawyer involvement as presumably, I mean, I don't know if there are other definitions. Um, this could be quite limited. So how do you guys, um, how did you reach this conclusion that this, this, whatever this is, is sufficient to put them in a relatively low risk category? And is it the case that if we say yes to this structure, which I, and I certainly agree with Wendy, I, I like this idea of trying to do it in a tiered way, it, are we, are we accepting footnote 12, question mark? Yeah, I, I guess the answer, and maybe Lucy can add some color to this, but that is a piece that evolved for us where we would have applicants coming in with different sort of descriptions of how their lawyers were or weren't going to be involved in the particular service versus non-lawyers. And that footnote really is something that got added into the manual as things came along and we with yeah. some articulation yeah. around it. And I think that's, that's a little bit the dynamic here, you know, is it, it does take, it does take some uh, seeing the examples to decide, is that enough lawyer involvement to say, yes, that amounts to lawyer involvement, but maybe Lucy's got her hand up to clarify something for me. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. Seems, it seems like you need a standard and this is an example of a standard, but I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Lucy, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go. No, no, no. Um, it's fine. It, 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 it's, it is a little uh, uh, confusing or can be. I think what, what we wanted to try and get at was giving entities space to, to develop their own practices from which, you know, we hope to see emerge best practices eventually, but we, you know, it's still relatively early in the game. But this is not, this is meant to mark something other than 5.3 supervision. You know, um, 5.3 is pretty specific about what, you know, that supervision involves and who it must cover. And, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty um, involved. And so we wanted to create a category that was not at the 5.3 level, but still 
still still marked a model in which lawyers are on an ongoing basis over time over the over the whole <laughs> of this entity's existence are regularly overseeing the legal services providing quality checks what have you that is different from something like um, Stacy's other uh, entity in the sandbox which is AAA fair credit people's legal aid in which there is not an ongoing lawyer role the lawyers involved in the front end helps train up these um, medical debt advisors and then is not performing mm -hmm. an ongoing quality function. And so that model is in the high risk. But I just wanted to correct one thing that you said, Tom, which was um, all non-lawyer provision in, in the Utah model is moderate or high risk. Those, so it's not, you know, it isn't, it's it's our next, it's our highest and next highest tiers of. Oh, I see. For them. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually the, the, the oversight that the regulator takes for both of those entities is pretty extensive, um, including okay. monthly reporting and audits. I guess, uh, oh, yeah. go ahead, Tom. Well, I was gonna say, I, I'm i gonna be a little utterly unfair to you, Lucy, but mm -hmm. is there in the back of your mind a standard? I mean, is there, we want the lawyer, I mean, I understand it's not a traditional 5.3 relationship, but we want there to be enough lawyer input here to what's the output you're looking for or what's the standard that for which these are examples of that standard being used? Uh, well, the output is always the same, which is that you don't, there's not excessive consumer harm um, across all entities. And so one way of, of correcting for that, at least, you know, if you, if you assume that lawyers are, are, Behold, you know, and, and are able to perform that function is having this lawyer supervision. Um, and that could be in, through traditional 5.3, which we do already, right? Pretty much all states, I think, have a version of 5.3. Um, in the sandbox context, it could be something maybe less um, uh, intensive than 5.3, but still an ongoing uh, lawyer quality check role. Um, and, and that is what our moderate category is, that lawyer involvement category. Um, or it could be, uh, or it could be, you know, no lawyer involvement at all on an ongoing basis, and that would bump you up to high risk, in which case the regulator does more of that quality check. Um, but the output is always the same across, and that's partly why this, that's part of one of the reasons for this approach is that the output is always supposed to be the same, which is that um, that oh. that those consumer harm mechanisms are are the the um, we're not seeing evidence that there's consumer harm occurring above our threshold. So, so I, I really see I see uh, I see our chair weighing in, and I know we okay. probably pretty much spent our time. I I guess the one thing I'm wondering about in terms of advancing this particular project is 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 there such a thing as getting the straw poll sense of whether people would go with option A or option B on this overall approach? Or Justice Tucker, do you think that's gonna take more time than we really can take? I think as long as it's just a straw poll and you're just getting a sort of input to take back to the committee, not a final decision, that that's very helpful. And we should okay. ask me to, with that understanding, to call the roll. Basically okay. it's a one-dimensional versus a two-dimensional preference. That's right. Option A is the one-dimensional service model based one. Option B is the Eric Bridget grid with a little more a texture around nature of service. So Mimi, it's really finding out if people would generally want to see option A or generally want to see option B as far as going forward. Option A is one dimensional. Option B is multidimensional. Right. Okay. Uh, Justice Tucker. Uh, I don't think I vote on this one. Thank oh, you. it's a straw poll, so it's fine. I'm not going to vote. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, Marta Alkenbrock. Uh, B, the multidimensional. Okay, Andrew Arruda, Judge Irma Asbury, Mary Baldwin. Uh, option B. Judge Wendy Chang. Option B. David Engstrom. Option A. Tom Green. Yeah, I like B. Dan Grunfeld. B. Eric Helland. I'm gonna vote against myself and go option A. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Huang. Okay, Micah Star Liberty. B. John Lund. A. Kevin Moore. Wendy Musell. I can't decide. <laughs> Sorry. 
Okay, Crispin Passmore, Lucy Rica. Hey. Toby Rothschild. Hey. Becky Sandifer. Hey. Jim Sandman. B. Hey. Patricia Scatiero. Stein. Uh, Sacha Steinberger. B. Hey. Okay, give me a second. Five people for A and more people for B. <laughs> okay. Nine. Five, nine, and three undecided. Got it. So option B was preferred. Thanks, everyone. All right. So uh, with apologies to Sage that we were not able to give all of your work the attention that I know it was ready for and deserved, I want to just um, come highlight for everybody that we got a list of tools in the Sage memo that we were going to vote on. And if we still have time before this meeting is over, we're going to come back to that. But for now, I would like to march ahead so that the other items on the agenda get at least a discussion. And I note that we have them on the discussion uh, on the agenda, uh, some of them listed for discussion and some of them listed for discussion and uh, possible action. But I think in terms of what the uh, committees have, what the scope committee has prepared for their uh, discussion items, they really are in the nature of, we'd really like input in the, uh, in the discussion context but not uh, action. So with that understanding, uh, I turn it over to Becky and Tom. Take it away, Tom. So I mind D? Yes. Okay, let me find my little thing here. I think that's more you, Becky, as a matter of fact. I, my apologies, but. So this is a, my, my agenda, the special secret insider agenda has your name on it, Tom. Oh. <laughs> in in <laughs> all caps. Okay. <laughs> if you're not ready to do that right now, we can skip ahead and do uh, agenda item E. I would call on Bridget to address the uh, memo on attorney involvement. If you want me to skip you for now, Tom. Yeah, why don't you skip me for the moment? Okay. Bridget? Uh, sure. Wendy, do you mind? I mean, uh, Mimi, can you put that one up? Thanks. So what, what I provided here was, di we just did some research, staff did some research on um, particular models around requiring attorneys to be like, th there's different terms. I'll just use the term compliance lawyer for now. Somebody identified um, within an entity that would be responsible for uh, assuring that all the rules were being complied with. And so we just kind of did a little survey of jurisdictions um, that are regulating entities in one way or the other. Right now, Utah is the only one that is operating a sandbox. The other ones that I have in here, Arizona, um, and then I also included some examples from the SRA from the UK, um, from Victoria in Australia, and I think I have some Canadian examples in here too, but um, just note that those groups are regulating ABSs outside of a sandbox, so it's a little bit different. You know, they don't have kind of the way that Utah is set up to have the monitoring going on a regular basis, it's a little bit different. So just note those two distinctions. But basically what I just wanted to provide is that Utah as a model does not require a specific responsible attorney designation, but the other jurisdictions that just regulate ABS in general do have some kind of requirement. You can tell um, scrolling through the memo, I just put the different rules in there for Arizona. And then if you keep going down Mimi, um, England and Wales through the Solicitor's Regula Regulation Authority have quite a few different people that they require be designated. They have a legal practice, the compliance officer for legal practice, but they also have someone for finance and administration. Um, and so that's just a different you know, model. And then Victoria and Australia, they, they have someone that where they call an authorized principal who has to be a licensee. And then Canada, um, 
actually there, as we talked about earlier in this meeting, there Ontario is going to be rolling out a sandbox. Um, I think even in the next couple of weeks. So we, they don't have their rules posted yet, but when they do, we can update the group on what they've decided to do. And there's another sandbox in, in British Columbia where they actually haven't had this, per, I think it, it sounds to me the way they're doing their sandboxes more like people are coming to them and then they're kind of making determinations as they go. So they haven't made a determination yet that they need to actually that they're requiring this upfront. I think maybe it would be more something like once they look at a model that they have concerns about, they might require somebody to designate a responsible attorney, but it's not set forth in a particular rule right now. Um, so I just, this was really just meant to give everyone a sense of different models, the way that it's happened. There's sites and links if you wanna dig into it a little bit more. Um, but I think the idea behind this agenda item was really just to get a discussion going from this group with where people are leaning on this issue and then just to advise um, the scope subcommittee as they go back and make a recommendation for the full group's uh, voting. That, that's exactly why I was eager to see this put on the agenda because I think it's a fairly important issue that has some cross cutting uh, impacts on both committees. And while scope will be the committee that takes the lead on coming up with a specific recommendation, there are a collection of questions and I would just like to solicit uh, people's thoughts on whether every sandbox entrance should be required to have a continuing relationship of some sort with a member of the California bar who will be responsible at some level for the activities, uh, the legal services activities of that, of that sandbox entrance or not. And if we're going to require a continuing relationship between every entrance every sandbox entrant and its compliance attorney. Uh, do we care whether that relationship is anything other than a, anything more solid than a, a, you know, than a basic relationship that could be just a, a part-time contractual sort of a thing as opposed to full-time employee or officer of the, of the company or owner um, or, or some, you know, central management responsibility in a corporate sense, as well as in a um, responsibility for legal services sense. So I know this is an issue that many of you have been thinking a lot about, and I suspect there are some strong views um, and recognizing that the views expressed today are inherently preliminary because we aren't acting, uh, we don't have an action item before us. Uh, we wanted to open the floor for, uh, let's say a, a 15 minute discussion um, on the question of an attorney role. So who would like to speak to that point? Starting with Becky Sandifer. Who's on mute? First, I would like to unmute. Then I would like to argue that um, there, there, need, there may need to be such a person. I think that's a good model, but there's no need for that person to be an attorney. So I, my understanding of what this person would do is would would help to ensure two things. One is compliance with the with the regulations, both by being on site to monitor them, but also by being on the hook for uh, violations. Um, also to ensure future compliance, so you could lose your right to practice law, for example, if your your entity that you're responsible for horribly misbehaved. Um, that could be done by someone who's not an attorney who could lose other things if they, if they show bad, bad, um, bad responsibility. So they could lose their ability to ever participate in a sandbox again. They could lose their right to be licensed to do other kinds of things. So there, there are ways to ensure compliance that don't require attorneys. I think if Crispin Passport were here, he would point out that other people are also ethical. It doesn't require attorneys to be ethical. I think the other thing you're looking for is competence, right? So you want you want the services that are offered to be of a decent quality, and that can be ensured by getting legal expertise in when they are designed and when you design the monitoring processes for them. But again, I don't think that person needs to be, those authorized people need to be attorneys. And I'll just remind us of one more thing. If you think about the work that we did in designing the application process, we've already said that every authorized person is subject to a, a character and fitness check that looks a lot like the character and fitness check that, that people who are admitted to the California bar are subject to. So we're already treating those people in very rigorous ways, the same ways we treat lawyers. So I, I think, yes, we need such a person, but I don't think that person needs to be an attorney. 
Thank you, Becky. Other thoughts? John. I guess I'm uh, feeling a little uninformed about this subject in the context of how the rest of the world outside the provision of legal services works. And is there sort of a model where there is a, you know, I, I guess I, maybe there is a model, for example, with SEC and public corporations that have to have somebody on the line. But that's one question I have is, you know, could, is this, if, is this a, a way that is typically used? What, what's part of what's happening here is we're moving from away from regulating the individual solely as an individual and not having the direct consequence of, you know, pulling their bar license or whatever it might be. But we also are, are trying to figure out a way to safely regulate this entity and make sure that internally, you know, they have their processes. So I, I understand that dynamic, but I'm not sure that the way we have this described here is the way we accomplish that most effectively. And then the last thing I'd say before giving up the floor is part of the reason Utah doesn't have this requirement is because we're trying, we were trying to eliminate anything that we could that would stand in the way of potential innovations and let the innovations come and see what they look like and then lay in the requirements that it would feel were appropriate for that innovation. And sadly, we haven't seen anybody come in that doesn't have lawyers involved in some way or another. So. Okay, thank you. Um, Marta. Hi, um, I would be in favor of the Arizona approach. I think we need a lawyer to monitor um, the delivery of legal services. Um, just like, you know, if it was a medical group, I'd want a doctor to uh, also be somebody who is monitoring the um, medical services that are given out to patients within its care. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at the, a brand new delivery of legal services to uh, consumers. And I think we need somebody who um, is familiar with the practice of law in order to make sure to ensure that uh, competent legal services are being um, delivered by qualified staff and qualified individuals who can deliver those. So I think it's utmost importance, um, you know, that we have a lawyer at the helm or a compliance lawyer involved in the, in the delivery of legal services and in, in, in the uh, entity that's developing them or delivering them rather, thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question? Cause you said two things and I wanna know if you have a view as the difference. You said involved in, and then you said at the helm. Are you satisfied with a lawyer being involved in and responsible for, but not being at the helm? Well, I, I think that's an interesting question, and I think we'd have to go into the the business models that are being that are being that are uh, applying for um, uh, entry into the sandbox. But I, Arizona has a compliance lawyer and must designate that compliance lawyer, and I I, sus I suppose that is an individual that not only is ensuring the delivery of competent legal services, but is also the person. The point of contact with, with respect to the sandbox regulators that information is flowing through, which I think would be a very important person that uh, you know that the regulators would want to be in regular communication with. So I think that individual would have many purposes, but I think that would be very handy. Thank you, Tom, and then Wendy. Yeah, I think I'm. My my thinking on this has not fully coalesced. Um, the idea of a compliance attorney or a head of chambers. I mean, this was used um, by England, by Wales, by Australia, and by Arizona, and there may be others. But the idea here is that if you have non-attorney ownership, they go to a stock exchange. They're owned by. Um, accountants or whatever. The, um, the idea that there would be somebody who is personally responsible for making sure the legal services firm delivers its legal services completely consistent with the rules, that strikes me as a really good idea. But I think, and I would love to have Crispin's thoughts on this, but you know, that becomes less 
easy to support when it becomes a pure technology firm, when you've got um, mostly tech people with sort of attorney advisors. And I think um, in that space, I think we need to look closely at the, intern the attorney involvement is, uh, definition that was in the Utah um, sort of model and think seriously about what we might be able to get by with if we use something less than the, you know, there's a, there's a lawyer box inside the company and that's where all the legal services are created and delivered, um, in which case a head of chambers makes sense. In a tech, pure tech company, I'm not sure that is the right answer, but um, my thinking is, again, is evolving. But I think for some parts of this, and certainly from my perspective, unquestioningly, the least dangerous situation for us, I think, is an ABS uh, if we, if an ABS with this kind of a head of chamber structure is probably one of the least dangerous uh, programs we could we could authorize and observe. Okay, thanks, Wendy. Part of what I think about with this uh, question is that for corporate structures, if they hit a snag, they can simply reform themselves under a different name and or go bankrupt without having uh, you know, any sort of um, compliance issues necessarily to address um, some of the harms that may have occurred. Um, and so particularly where it's the provision of legal services, an attorney has their license on the line. And if they lose their license, they lose their ability to have any sort of livelihood. So there's built-in incentives to comply with the rules um, that are different. It's not to say, of course, that, that corporations don't comply generally, but we can all think of off the top of our head, half a dozen situations in all different sectors where that just simply wasn't the case and they could reform themselves under a different um, nomiker and just move along, right? And so, my concern is if we don't have an attorney who is responsible, not just a contract attorney, um, who has their license on the line, is uh, it builds in incentives uh, that are against the consumer protection that we're all, uh, you know, should be focused on. Thank you, Eric, and then Sasha. This is really a kind of picking up on Tom's point, but from the other side, which is I was wondering about um, nonprofits uh, and kind of what we were hearing about earlier in the day. And it, it seems like this could be a real barrier to some of the, the ones that, you know, I4J was describing that, you know, how would you, you know, how would you have a, uh, a compliance attorney for, you know, some of these that, that were, you know, uh, social workers say being able to give very limited legal advice. So I don't have an answer to that. I just, you know, something is, creating a barrier to those kind of innovations, you know, having some, some way we can think about some flexibility and who that person would be if we decide to go this route, because I do think that could be a real uh, hindrance to some of the things even that were described today. Thank you, Sasha. I was gonna say um, much what Eric just said, just that for nonprofits, um, if there, if I can imagine the argument, obviously for a compliance lawyer involved in the project, but does it have to be at the same organization? If you're really trying to work with um, community members who are trusted by the community, especially with low income populations, we are trying to actually get ahead of legal issues and move upstream. You are not in legal settings. And so we're largely not working with lawyers if we're working with people. And so just really trying to think through having that frame when we think about who that compliance lawyer is and that they don't have to necessarily be part of the same organization. Thank you, Dan. There's uh, two points to what we are charged to do. One is obviously encourage innovation, but another part is protecting the public. It seems to me that getting a lawyer uh, involved um, solves that second uh, goal. And if it results in slightly less innovation in some circumstances, but more protection for the public, certainly in a sandbox context, that's a, a compromise or a price that I would be supportive of. Thank you. Are there other people who wish to offer comments? I find 
the comments that have just been offered very useful and I don't want to cut it off prematurely, but if we're ready to move to the next agenda item, I hope oh, Toby has a comment. Thank you, Toby. You're on. Just following up Dan's and a couple of the other comments. Um, I can imagine, I, you know, I worked in the legal aid office for many years and one of the things we did was to support and work with and train nonprofits. I could see somebody in my legal aid office being responsible, if you will, being the responsible attorney overseeing uh, a, a non-lawyer delivery system uh, and being that responsible attorney or whatever the title is without being on the payroll or uh, full-time you know, active hmm. in that organization. So I could see that very easily. Oh. And a follow-up question, could some, do you think someone who's working in a legal aid office could, would it be taking it as a second job to be a compliance lawyer for a specific uh, nonprofit the way they might, for example, join the board of a nonprofit? Uh, no, I, I see it as delivering the services of that nonprofit, in other words, of, of the legal aid organization. One of Aha. The, so the legal aid organization would have perhaps a, a contractual relationship with the nonprofit to provide the nonprofit yeah. with a compliance attorney. Exactly. Got it. Very interesting. Uh, Dan, is that vestigial or do you have a new comment? Uh, no. Um, no, I was going to um, the support and add a little more color to uh, Toby's comments. Um, there are any number of nonprofit organizations in California and throughout the country who solve that role um, to any number of other nonprofits who actually deliver the services. And that involves uh, homelessness prevention, working with social workers, et cetera. So for some nonprofits, it's already part of their mission. They essentially represent the general counsel for multiple of multitude of, of entities. Um, I'm for now for myself, um, leave my, uh, my mind open as to whether it is a necessity that it be part of the organization or whether somebody outside can play that role. My, my point was, from my perspective, having a lawyer mandated on some level is, is, what, is something that I would support. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much. I'm going to gavel this agenda item to a close and move the, uh, I think, back to you, Tom, the initiative to address, uh, well, the previous agenda item on the agenda. Yes, Mimi, if you'd move to D, and I think it's page three, um, and I, I think David's still on, so let me tee this up and... Um, then David was sort of the leader of our pack in terms of this, but let me just provide a broad so, overview. So Tom, Tom, if I could jump in, I was just now pecking out a chat that I have to drop off. I had to drop off at the- Oh, okay. Then so I'll, I'll, um, so I'll, if you're I'll, hoping for some sort of an intro for me, uh, you're out of luck and you'll just- Yeah, to I got it. Your, your um, Toby, I, I don't sure that Kevin's on. So Toby may be my, my wingman here. Thank you very much though. Um, and kudos to David, because he was really the, the most significant um, author of this and kept us, uh, kept us on, on message and was very thoughtful about this. But um, if you look at page two, we make essentially um, nine different recommendations. Some are big, some are less big. Um, we start with um, essentially a, uh, a definition of what kind of entity would come or what kind of a service would come within the purview of the sandbox. So when you look at this, it's basically not permitted by um, professional rule 5.4, which is the ownership fee sharing, et cetera, or it's not uh, prohibit, uh, not authorized by a specific provision of the business and professions code. Um, which basically deals with the um, unlawful practice of law under the code or is otherwise not permitted by the rules of professional conduct. So that, that's the universe of entities that we suggest. And then the next three provisions, two, three, and four, all deal with an effort to try and skew entrance into the uh, sandbox in favor of those entities would, which would 
predominantly serve low and moderate income Californians. So we suggest in two that if an applicant can credibly demonstrate, one, we can talk about that um, for a while, uh, but if you can credibly demonstrate that your model will predominantly serve low and, in, low and moderate income Californians, the application will be prioritized. Three says, if you are such an entity, you don't pay an application fee. And fourthly, um, we're assuming there would, would be a tiered schedule and the um, applicant that is going to focus on low and moderate income Californians would be at the bottom of that series. Five and six um, deal with sort of hard uh, limitations on who can enter or who can be involved. So our five says that no sandbox application will be considered where a lawyer has been disbarred and then all the variations on disbarred um, is either a provider of legal services, a manager of legal services, or an equity owner. Um, note that this is different from the Utah model, which basically says that if somebody who's been disbarred has less than a 10% ownership interest, that person can have that ownership. This basically is a hard universal limitation. Um, six basically says if you're not authorized to practice law um, in California, uh, you are prohibited from providing legal services or managing legal service, the provision of legal services. So that's five and six. Uh, seven basically says that you're bound to all the various rules that apply to lawyers unless a rule has been waived in whole or in part. We've already sort of talked about this at a high level, but we do mention specifically rules 5.1 and 5.3. So 5.1 deals with supervision of subsidiary lawyers and 5.3, which we can talk about to, to a further degree because it may be more of a sticky wicket, um, that requires an attorney uh, who supervises non-lawyers to act in a certain way and impose upon those supervisees specific obligations consistent with uh, the rules of professional responsibility in the business and profession code. Eight, um, this is part of a process we talked about, um, we have talked about before, is that basically um, the requirements are that previously you must comply with the duties of confidentiality and competence. Um, and the sandbox participants obligations will also include whatever duties of care and fiduciary obligations apply otherwise. And finally, uh, a kind of uh, housekeeping matter number nine, um, if you come into the sandbox, you have to have a statutory agent for service of process. So um, Toby, why don't I kick it over to you and you can provide some more color and perspective on this. Okay, I'll try. Um, yeah, so I think the, the goal of this was to try to, again, uh, set out an outline, set out a, a framework, uh, recognizing that, uh, as I said earlier, we're not defining low and moderate, but we're saying that's what it is. And at the appropriate time, as we go further, we'll define what that means. But in fact, there are lots of defin different definitions of that. Uh, in California law and regulation already, and federal law and regulation that, that we can borrow from or uh, come up with our own. But at, at this point, we're just saying that's the focus of those uh, of those three items. Um, it, it, we're not saying the others can't participate. In fact, we're saying everybody's welcome in. Uh, mm -hmm. But that let's give some some early preference to those that are aiming at. Uh, what a lot of people perceive as where the justice gap is, which is at the low end of the scale. Um, I think uh, the, another one that I would point out particularly is, is uh, item seven with the discussions of 5.1, and 5.3, uh, and particularly 5.2, which is the one that says if uh, that um, 
each person has their own individual obligation to comply with the rules. And the fact that your supervisor told you uh, to do something different doesn't exonerate you from your obligation to follow the rules. And that's true then, whether it's a lawyer or a non-lawyer that's being supervised, uh, that non-lawyer has the same obligation under 5.2 to, to follow the rules. Um, and I think other things that I would particularly point out. Um, I guess one, one just uh, aside, and that is that <coughs> on the disbarred lawyers, I think that we did, um, there's an issue around what happens when somebody is suspended but reinstated. Uh, and I think that where we came out on that is if, if things are bad enough that you were uh, disbarred or suspended, uh, that you shouldn't, as long as it's a sandbox while we're in this trial phase that you ought to be out. But that if, you know, one, once these things become available to everybody, then it, the same rules would apply as to the bar generally. But for purposes of this sandbox, because we want to sort of keep it pure and, and keep it client protection at, as a high priority that we would keep those people out forever. Um, so that's, that's probably the key things that I would raise. And then the last part, the notes and discussion items are other items that we never quite got to. We raised a bunch of other questions, but we never came to a resolution on, on uh, what specifically we should recommend on those. Yeah, and I keep me honest on this, but so I mentioned 5.3 at the top. Yeah. So the, the unexplored, largely unexplored question is what happens to those obligations that are imposed upon lawyers who take on a supervisorial role. Um, what does that mean to the entities that within which they are embedded? Um, since the, the, the obligation for California attorneys is that they make sure that those folks follow the California rules. Mm -hmm. um, we do raise the question about the extent to which a sandbox entrance can have no lawyers at all. Um, the Arizona ABS structure does not appear to permit such entities, but we lay out some of the um, some of the perspectives on this. Um, and I think our ultimate thought was that uh, mandating lawyer involvement might cut against the idea of um, bringing lawyers in at appropriate points in time to advise the non-lawyer based ABS, but. Uh, Toby, once I tee up this third thing, maybe you can just um, uh, relate to that. And then a third question is whether it might be necessary to redefine firm or law firm in rule 1.0.1 uh, to make sure that, that the duties, which are basically amongst others competence, um, are imposed by way of a, a, an amendment to the ethics rules. And then back to you, Toby, anything you wanna say on this second? major point or unresolved issues? Uh, yeah, no, I think that the, the, you know, the issue of who supervises who and what the consequences are. Uh, I think the issue that was raised in our group was this question of if you require a lawyer, uh, will that, if you, if you, if you impose on a lawyer all those obligations, uh, Will that encourage non-lawyer based organizations, discourage them from having a lawyer when maybe it would be a good thing for them to do? Uh, or are they are we better off if we say, well, if there's a lawyer, they can be, they don't have to be the supervisor, uh, but they can provide advice and, and oversight without you know, being the direct supervisor. Because then if somebody could be a non-lawyer organization, why would they bring a lawyer in that that adds extra cost and and complications for them uh, and maybe we maybe we want to permit that broad range of, of organizations and, and don't want to limit it to only those that have a lawyer involved in supervising yeah but I you know just the obvious point we just discussed this this question of lawyer involvement so we may have already crossed this Rubicon but in any case <laughs> that was our thinking and um, 